Todd a formless question. If he could have put it into words, he would have asked if the God's mercy was to have let him live for so long. Twenty years is better than nine. Or was the God's mercy to die this way, and not a different, worse way? Or simply to come home, to the haven of the gods, mother, father, sister, a wash of loneliness, of longing, of yes. Yes, maybe that was it. Maybe that was what the God had meant. Mercy, a promise that the final moment before this world became the next one would be as sweet as love. But he could not think this, or understand it. He simply felt it. This question that was many questions condensed into an iron bead, the head of a pin, a tiny hard point of dread and hope and relief. His horse, his damned horse! The animal kept straining its will against Aaron's. This horse was going to get him killed. Aaron tried to feel worried. His sword opened someone's belly. He wasn't sure how. His blade shouldn't have got past Valorian armour, but entrails probed out of a gash, a slow, wet unfolding. Aaron ended it. To come home, mused his god, who had been able to take the iron bead of Aaron's heart and make it a feather, and could separate each barb from the other all along down the quill. The god ran a finger down the unnaturally fanned vein. Is that what you think I meant by mercy? Is that what you want? Well, Aaron, well. Kestrel didn't understand why no one attacked her. Then she did, and felt stupid and grateful. Her armour, her Valorian looks. Roshar's forces knew her, knew her horse, but to the Valorians she seemed to be one of their own. Oddly positioned, if they thought about it, but no one thought. They gurgled from cut throats. They drove swords so far into bodies that their fists vanished inside someone else's flesh. She moved Javelin among them. Valorian, Dacron, Harani. Little ghost. Yes, she didn't exist. Even when someone's blood sprayed her cheek, it didn't feel real. No one touched her. Until she saw Roshar hack a sword from someone's grip, smash his shield into the Valorian's nose and slice in at the neck. The prince kneed his horse out of the path of the body's fall. He wheeled his horse and saw Kestrel. Where's Arryn? he shouted. Kestrel's voice didn't work. I don't know, she finally said, the whisper hoarse. Roshar wouldn't have been able to hear, even if he weren't several feet away, but a nearby Valorian heard. He'd seen the look between her and the prince, had heard them speak the Dacron tongue, a cavalry officer. He shouldered his horse into hers, reached, grabbed her throat. A scout! His dark eyes were narrow, his teeth bared. In the vanguard? Name your regiment! she gasped. Traitor! He knocked the sword from her limp hand. Kestrel! Roshar, too far away. She strained to breathe. She didn't break his gaze. Whispering something she knew he couldn't hear, she watched the Valorian lean forward, loosen his grip just slightly. Kestrel reached for her dagger and drove it into his armpit. He grunted, let go. She jerked her dagger free and pierced his throat. His weight sagged against her. He was gasping in her ear, the sound sticky and wet, blood gushing onto her as she tried to keep her seat, tried to push the armoured officer away, but his horse balked. The Valorian gripped her, his brown eyes staring, vengeful, fading. With the last of his strength, he dragged her down with him.
he pulled her from her horse. Aaron's horse was bad, but it'd be much worse to be without one. He cut a space around him. The frontier between army and army was dissolving. Kestrel must be several ranks behind him. The Valorians would soon reach her. Stay close, he'd said. His anxiety rose, making him vicious. Some part of him stared at what his hands and body did, but the larger part of him grew yet larger and took satisfaction. There was pleasure and murder, along with worry at his pleasure, running through all of it a sheer stream of fear. Stay close. He turned his horse back, and if he couldn't find her, farther back, still farther, the Valorians had already eaten their way into the rank where she and Javelin had been. His lungs squeezed shut. Where? he demanded. The general? his god coyly answered. Allow me to point you the way. Aaron's nerves screamed. Open your eyes, Death said. Look, my love, and see. Aaron did. He saw, not far away, Javelin standing amid the boil of war. His rider was gone. Kestrel's cheek was in the sand. Her mouth was full of it. She coughed and spat, her back and shoulders sinking into the beach, and pushed at the dead body heaped onto her. She tried to lever it off. Her arms gave out. She saw the misting sky, her horse close. She pushed again at the officer. His armour made him heavier. She was soaked with his blood. She felt it still pumping, heard the chaos around her. Panic stitched down her spine. She shoved. The body didn't budge. She tried harder, felt the weight press her chest. Finally, she screamed. Something slammed into Aaron. He kept his seat, wheeled to see his attacker, saw the Valorian's grin, and then, too late, the serrated steel along the length of the man's boot. Aaron noticed it right before the Valorian used his foot like a knife and slashed the exposed ribs of Aaron's horse. The animal's cry pierced Aaron's ears. He was pitched to the ground. In war, her father sometimes said, you might live, you might die, but if you panic, death is the only outcome. She hated him for his coolness, his rules, but the body crushed her, but the sand. She tried to see if she could turn onto her belly. Wriggling, she shifted beneath the body. As she strained to turn, she waited for someone to notice her and attack. She waited for hooves to crush her skull, but Javelin stood solidly, right where he'd been the moment she'd fallen. Cavalry manoeuvred around the harmless horse. No one was looking at the ground. Worming into the sand, she flipped onto her front and began to dig, sweeping the sand away from her, as if swimming. She dug her elbows into the trough she'd made and pulled. She slipped free. Aaron scrambled to his feet, dodged just in time the kick of the serrated boot to his head. With both hands, where was his sword? He seized the Valorian's ankle and hauled the man off his horse. Kestrel's shaking hands sifted through the sand for her dagger. Her dagger. She must find it. She could not lose it. When she found the ridge of it beneath a veil of red sand, Tears pricked her eyes. She seized its hilt. Javelin was steady, waiting for her. She wanted to lean against him and press her face into his hide. She wanted to become a horse so that she could thank him in a way he would understand. She went to mount him, then saw, over the rise of her saddle, Aaron. From the beach, Aaron snatched a sword. His? 
didn't matter, and was already swiping it down through the air toward the fallen Valorian's neck, when the man surged to his feet, struck Arryn's blade aside with his own, and drove its point toward Arryn. Arryn countered, heard the skittering of steel against steel, and felt the vibration, the pressure. He felt the pressure give. The man's blade sank for an instant. But it was a trick. In that moment of seeming weakness, the Valorian's other hand went for his dagger, which he stabbed into a gap where Arryn's armour joined. Kestrel was stumbling forward on the sand, her legs too sluggish, she couldn't move fast enough. The Valorian's back was to her, she could see Arryn's face, the crease between his brows, the inward quality of his expression, and then something shifting, a flare, a recognition. The Valorian stabbed, Arryn cried out. The dagger bit into his ribs, pain laced up his side. He struck back, sword dancing harmlessly down the Valorian's armour, doing no more damage than to cut the laces of the man's right boot. You're mine, said the Valorian, which was what death always said. Arryn, surprised to hear the god's words come from a human mouth, faltered. He felt strange. He thought, ah. He thought, grateful. He welcomed the god's warning, realised that he'd always wanted to know before it happened. He wouldn't want to blink too suddenly out of this life. But he loved this life. He loved the girl in it. His heart punched hard, rebelled. Too late. The base of the Valorian's blade was coming at his head, angled for his neck, Arryn tried to duck. The hilt slammed into his temple. Darkness bled across his vision. He couldn't feel his legs. He tried to hear his god, but he heard only silence. And then he heard nothing at all. Chapter 33 She saw Arryn go down, she skidded in the sand as she ran, her ears roaring, her mind closed over, a shaking dread. A few paces away, her dagger was tight in her hand, the Valorian's back was an armoured wall. The man raised his sword again, he didn't hear her come at him, but where, where? She had a dagger, but there was nowhere to stab, not the back of the neck which she couldn't reach, not the torso or even the legs. He was armoured from shoulders to boots. A dagger wants flesh, her father would say. Find it. A great pressure in her chest. Desperation as she came up behind. She didn't know what to do. Couldn't think. And then it was as if someone else noticed the looseness at the top of one of the man's boots and dropped her to her knees in the sand. She seized the boot's top, yanked it back and slashed the ropey tendon at the ankle. He screamed. She seemed to feel him feel the excruciating pain of the cut tendon curling up into his calf, his collapse, the pumping agony. How a girl climbed onto him, feral, fox-like, but a girl? But her hair, her skin, her eyes, her armour, not the enemy, the enemy. Then the dagger found his throat and he knew exactly what she was. Her hand, her arm, bright red. She couldn't let go of the dagger, she made herself sheathe it. She needed her hands, she needed Aaron. The sprawl of him. She was weeping, crouched in the sand, empty fingers wild when she reached him, searched him, found the dagger in his side, his blackened brow, purple cheek, split skin. She touched his face and felt his head loll. A pulse, or just her own pulse. Her body vibrated with it. 
She couldn't keep her fingers steady against the hollow under his jaw. She made herself look again at the dagger in his side and unbuckled the armour to see better. Only the tip of the dagger had entered the flesh. It was stuck between the ribs. Her sudden hope was savage. She didn't want to pull the dagger out. She had nothing to staunch a flow of blood and returned her attention to Aaron's head. This time, when her fingers went for his pulse, she found it, and she knew it to be his. Her tears flowed fresh. The wound in his side was minor, yet a blow to the head can do anything. Can kill, paralyse, take away his senses, his mind. It could make him sleep forever. Aaron, wake up! Once the words came, they didn't stop. We have to move. We can't stay here. Please. Please wake up. I love you. Don't leave me. Wake up. Listen to me, Aaron. Listen. Someone was weeping. Her tears fell warm on his brow, his lashes, his mouth. Don't cry, he tried to say. Please listen she said. He would. Of course he would. How could she think that he wouldn't? This felt familiar, unreal. He had the sense that this had happened before, or would happen, that this was either an echo or its source. If he opened his eyes, the world would double. His skull throbbed. Stones weighted his eyes. He was covered with earth, thick and loamy and loose. A comfort, it eased the nauseating ache. Yet there were no stones, no earth. A part of him knew this, the same part that clung to the woman's voice. Her voice was breaking apart. He heard it turn horrible. Soon, he realised, she would scream. Don't, he managed, and opened his eyes and was sick. He wondered at it, faintly, her expression, that mix of anguish and relief. Her hands were wholly still for a moment, then instantly busy, lifting a canteen of water to his mouth, trying to worm under his weight and lift. Too heavy. I'm sorry, she said. Aaron, you must get up. I don't think I can. Yes, just to Javelin, come on. She was tugging at him, shoulders, arms. He didn't have the heart to tell her to stop, that the ache in his head was monstrous, that every jostle hurt. He tried to focus and saw Javelin standing nearby, saw the undulating crush of soldiers and metal. Fear entered him. This little piece that sheltered him and Kestrel couldn't last long. Impossible that no one had noticed them, that no one had already brought a sword slicing through her neck as she knelt beside him and pulled and begged. Go, he told her. She recoiled. No, it's all right. He tried to touch her cheek, but either his vision was wrong or his hand was. He fumbled touched her nose and lips. I don't mind. Don't say that. Ride fast, far. Don't ask me that. You wouldn't do that. You would never leave me. But it's different, he tried to say. Then became lost in what he wanted to explain that this, her, what, sorrow, was dear to him, unexpected, so hard to heave words into his mouth, he realised his hand had fallen. Her face screwed into an expression he couldn't read. Get up, she said through her teeth. Please go. She curled fingers over the rim of his leather breastplate and gripped it. Make me. This time, Arryn recognised her expression. Determination. He closed his eyes so that he wouldn't see. You don't owe me anything, he would have said. You'll lose no honour if you leave. 
Arryn wondered if she knew the way her whole being could become a vow. He would say, tell me why you can't leave. Maybe if his head were clearer, he would know why without asking. For now, he saw only her determination and its danger. Was this his God's version of mercy? That she would die on this beach with him? Unbearable. Through the thump of his head, he discovered a different pain. Travelled down it, his side, his ribs, a dagger. He pulled it out. She made an appalled cry. His side became sticky. He dug the dagger into the sand and gripped her shoulder with his other hand. Felt his head split. Aaron pushed himself up, levering off the dagger. He tried to distance himself from what he was doing from the spasm that racked his body as he was sick again. On his knees, sky dark, rain, Kestrel's shoulder frail seeming in his hand, not able to bear his weight, surely, but she did. She strained to get him to his feet. Each stumble hurt, and he dreaded how it would be to mount Javelin and ride, but he would. He did, and she was with him. Eventually he couldn't tell if the sky was raining and dark or if his mind was. Everything was black and wet. As the horse moved beneath them, a quiet grew through the pain. A feeling floated over him, like sillage from a rare perfume. He seemed to hear the tinkle of a glass stopper lifted from a tiny flacon, the release of scent, how was it possible to smell flowers that weren't there? Aaron became aware that his thoughts were hard to hold. They vanished into smoke. It didn't matter. He let them go. Smoke, perfume, rain, all lovely, unlasting. The same, maybe, as whatever had made Kestrel swear that she wouldn't leave him. He wasn't sure what had made her do that, but it had been something. It had been real. This he wouldn't relinquish. This he would hold and remember. He saw Kestrel's hands on the reins. He felt his body slacken. Hoofbeats hammered his skull. Someone, deep voice, swore. You tied him to you? He nearly fell, he heard Kestrel say. Aaron opened his eyes. Rosha was untying the rope that bound him to Kestrel, the prince's gaze fixed on the knots. It wasn't like Rosha not to look at him. Well, that was stupid, the prince told her. Didn't you consider that if he truly started to fall, his weight would drag you off too? She was silent. She had considered this, Aaron could tell from her silence. Roshar's arm went around Aaron's waist. Come on, he said. Aaron sort of slid down from the horse and was steadied and held. You're bleeding on me, Roshar complained. Yes, Aaron supposed that he was bleeding, but his head, the ache was worse than anything. Aaron let himself sag against Roshar, dropped his brow to the man's shoulder, then he made himself open his eyes again. Kestrel stood to the side, arms tightly held to her chest. Beyond her lay an army encampment, hastily thrown together, smaller than before. What happened? Aaron asked. A bloodbath, Roshar said. We retreated. They seized the beach. I blame you. Kestrel sucked in a furious breath. He doesn't mean that, Aaron muttered. Are you going to make me carry you? Roshar said. Kestrel said something sharp. It wasn't that Aaron didn't hear the words. He was just too weary to absorb them. He heard Roshar's slow, drawling tones, Kestrel's hiss, Aaron wanted to tell her, he's hiding from you. He wanted to say, he's worried. Aaron was suddenly overwhelmed by their worry, 
by how everything was so unspoken. He stepped away from Rochard's supporting arm and began to walk with no real destination in mind. Rochard called him a filthy name, caught him before he fell. Bone and blood and breath of the goddess, Rochard said. What were you trying to prove? Arryn was on his back in Rochard's bed in his tent. The prince stood next to his bedside, posture taut and jumpy. A heavy warmth rested on Arryn's chest. Kestrel, her head pillowed against him as she slept, knelt on the ground, her upper body loosely draped over the bed's edge. His armour and tunic were gone, his ribs were bandaged, her palm lay on his belly. I would have carried you, Rochard said more quietly. I know. Arryn's voice woke her. She lifted her head, moved away. Her mouth was thin, her eyes smudged with shadows, braid half undone. The war, Arryn asked. Kestrel and Rochard exchanged a glance. That bad? Rest, Arryn, Kestrel said. Rochard clicked his teeth. Not too much. He keeps drifting in and out. Not good for a head injury like that. Keep him awake. Don't let him sleep. To Arryn, he said. I can't stay. I have to organize the retreat to the city. Arryn's stomach lurched. Retreat to the city was a last resort. Don't, he scrounged for a better idea. Kestrel looked silent and grim. Rochard said, I want to stay with you. I can't. Arryn lifted his palm to his friend's cheek. This startled the prince. Arryn saw him remember the Harani gesture, yet hesitate before returning it. It made Arryn sad. His hand fell. He traced a carving in the cot's frame, feeling awkward to have displaced Rochard from his bed. Where will you sleep? Have no fear. Many a bed would welcome me. After the prince left, Arryn asked Kestrel, Why did the battle go so badly? The question upset her. That's what you want to know? It's important. More important than how you nearly died. But I didn't. Her voice was clipped. My father has too much black powder, too many soldiers, too much experience. But how exactly did he win? A full frontal attack was enough. Once he eliminated the guns, I didn't see everything that happened. Guilt pulsed with the doubled heartbeat in his head. Because you rode away with me. Her eyes welled. I'm sorry, he said. Talk of something else. What you like? She opened her mouth, closed it. Her voice hushed. She said, do you remember the mosaic? Yes. How everything fit, as if each tile wanted to be next to each other. Yes. But he was confused. He wasn't sure what the mosaic meant to her, or why she thought of it now. She talked about it as if trying to explain that left was really right, or that it was both left and right, which made him realise that he knew that left and right were important, but he couldn't grasp their meaning or difference. He closed his eyes. Aaron, don't. Only for a little. No, she gripped his hand. Shh. Stories, she blurted. The mosaic told stories, didn't it? Yes, old ones. I'll tell them to you. His eyes cracked open. He didn't remember closing them. You know those tales? Yes. She didn't. This became clear as she began to tell them. She knew bits and pieces cobbled together in ways that would have made him smile if smiling didn't hurt. You, he breathed, are such a faker. Don't interrupt. 
mostly pure invention. She remembered the images. It pleased him how vividly she knew the temple floor's details, which god curled around which, or how the snake's tongue forked into three. But the stories she told had little to do with his religion. Sometimes they didn't even make sense. Do this again, he said, when I have strength to laugh. As bad as that? Mm, maybe not, for a Valorian. But eventually everything grew slow, unthreaded. He thought of raw cotton pulled apart, fibres trailing. Maybe Kestrel had talked for hours. He didn't know. When had she rested her cheek against his heart again? His chest rose and fell. Arin? I know, I shouldn't sleep, but I'm so tired. She threatened him. He didn't hear the whole of it. Lie with me, he murmured. It bothered him to think of her kneeling on the ground. Promise not to sleep? I promise. But he didn't mean it. He knew what would happen. She slipped in beside him. Everything became too soft, too dark, too velvet. He sank into sleep. He sighed and let go. Chapter 34 When she woke, he was gone. Kestrel's heart crashed against her ribs and didn't let up, not even when she pushed her way out of the tent and found Arryn making tea under the hollowed blue of a near-dawn sky. He stoked the little fire. What do you think you're doing? she demanded. I found a box of tea in the tent. Arryn saw her expression. Rochard won't mind. I mind. His gaze travelled between her and the pot of boiling water. What's wrong? You shouldn't have slept. I'm better for it. Maybe, but it hurt her to see his face, the inky bruise that spread over his brow and cheek and into the corner of his eye, the broken skin where he'd been struck at his temple. He wore a dirty tunic, perhaps because he didn't want to soil a clean one, Dried blood flaked the skin of his bare arms. An awful bubble expanded inside her chest. I shouldn't have slept. You needed to. The battle, the ride, it can't have been easy. No, it wasn't. Aaron turned the closed tea box in his hands. The dry leaves whispered. Thank you for saving me. I thought you were dead that you would die. He considered the box. I know how hard it is to watch someone die. Not someone. You, Arryn. He nodded but winced, set the box aside, and didn't seem to truly hear her. She sank to sit by the fire, her crooked arm resting on a bent knee drawn to her chest, she pressed her mouth and chin against her inner arm. You're still in pain. Not so much any more, which is why you must talk to me. Arryn, I am. About the war. She looked at him. He said, we can't retreat to the city. We can't face them in open battle. Not the entire Valorian force. Lerilyn proved that. Inviting them to lay siege to the city is no answer. I already tried once to hold the city against the general. He made short work of its defences. He breached the wall. It's repaired. This time you have the East as an ally. If you weren't trying to protect me right now with false optimism, what would you really say? The sky had lightened. She heard the camp begin to stir. Be honest, Kestrel. About the war. Her voice was flat. His expression shifted slightly. He set his thumb against his jaw, fanning dirty fingers over his scarred cheek. Is there something else? His fatigue, his bruises, 
the pain he was trying to hide, the way her heart had grown scales, but inside, hot as a live coal. He said, We both know what will happen if we retreat to the city. So she said it. The East might look at its losses, see a likely defeat, and leave, even if Rochelle wants to stay. And then it's over. Aaron's grey eyes were naked. I can't lose. There'll be nothing left for me if I do. That's not true. But he had stood. The camp was awake. His small fire had gone out. The tea, forgotten, had cooled. She kept her head bowed. We must retreat inland until I think of something better. Aaron stepped close to her, his footfalls hushed by the pale, sandy earth with its wisps of grass. He touched the nape of her neck, fingertips brushing down to the first bones of her back. He gently hooked the collar of her shirt. Her skin sang so loud that she couldn't think of any words, let alone the right ones, and by the time she knew that she should, that it was now that it wouldn't hurt to say what she felt, that she could give her love to someone without being broken for it, Aaron had already gone. Rosha had a litter brought to Aaron, who glanced at it and the men assigned to carry it. No, said Aaron. Idiot, the prince sneered. You are knocked unconscious. You look like hell. Get in the litter. I'll go in a cart. Aaron said, referring to wagons that carried the wounded. I don't need special treatment. Oh, yes, you do. Kestrel had never seen Rochar so angry. Why? Aaron squinted at him. Because of your concern, or because you want to send a message to the army. Kestrel could think of two messages— to show the Dacrans that the supposedly God-touched Harani leader was weak, or to show the Harani that the Eastern prince valued Arryn. Maybe both. Roshar's mouth twitched into an unhappy smile. Then I'll ride, Arryn said. When the day ended and the army set camp on a low hill whose bushes bore thick, oily green leaves, Roshar stood near his tent as an officer set it up. The prince's fingers drummed the muscles of his crossed arms. Kestrel didn't know where Arryn was. She thought he'd gone to water his new horse at a stream near camp, but when Roshar's tent was up and the sun down and Arryn hadn't returned, an icy mist of anxiety stole over her. He'll be more comfortable there. Roshar jerked his chin at his tent. And you? she asked. He shrugged. Harim won't like it. I don't care. Then he added the words coming in a rush. The litter wasn't symbolic. No hidden message. Not everyone speaks in cold. I just want him to be well. Slowly, she said. I think that he is. She had watched him during the day's ride, and although his face had grown drawn, it seemed more from weariness than pain. He'd easily kept his seat and met her sidelong looks with a small smile. Her concern had lessened. Not entirely, though. Not enough to keep her from searching the camp after Roshar had left her by his pitch tent. Not enough to uncurl her fingers, squeezed into fists after the sky's humid indigo had darkened. She returned to the tent and lit a lantern. Inside, she chafed her arms as if cold, eyeing the burning wick. She meant to measure it. After it burned down to a certain mark, she'd search for him. But the wick had barely begun to sizzle before she seized the lantern's handle, hurried toward the tent's canvas door, and smacked into Arryn as he entered. She gasped, Where have you been? He ran a hand through his wet hair, glanced down at his damp shirt. He smelled of soap. Well. A bath? Bath makes a cold creak sound so glamorous. 
In the dark? There's a moon. I was ready to make Roshar help me find you. Oh, I saw him. He directed me here, emphatically. Aaron lifted his brows, impressed. The wording he used was very creative. Kestrel became aware of how close she stood to Aaron. The lifted lamp gilded his face, illuminating the peak of the tent's apex above. It radiated a small heat between him and her. She moved away. He touched the clenched hand that held the lamp. Little fists, what's wrong? Both you and Roshar are angry. All I've done is get hit on the head. And sleep. And ride. And bathe. Well, I was disgusting. Kestrel turned and strode to the table. She set the lamp down, practically slamming it. Aaron followed. I don't know how to prove to you that I'm all right. She kept her back to him. Something terrible was clawing up her throat. I was lucky, Aaron said. I had you, and a hard head, and the grace of my God. Damn your God! Aaron caught her arm above the elbow. She turned to face him. All trace of humour had left his face. His eyes were wide, urgent. Don't say that. Why not? I can say anything. Anything except what really matters. Kestrel, take it back. You'll offend him. Your God risks you. He protects me. You're his plaything. You're wrong. He loves me. Saying those words made him look so alone. He reminded her of sails curved by the wind, full and yet empty at the same time. She found that she was jealous of his God. The sudden jealousy held her so hard in its grip that she couldn't breathe. It's true, Aaron insisted. She saw then that she had hurt him, that his God's love was all the more precious to him because of his fear that he would find it nowhere else. Her anger rinsed away. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I ask your pardon, his too. Aaron released her, his relief plain. I'm not really angry at a God, she said, or you. His brow creased. All right, yes, you a little. She gently thumped his chest, then rested her palm flat and wide against his heart. He went very still. Why is it so hard for you to take care of yourself? He was silent. Her thumb rested in the hollow of his collarbone. She felt his pulse jolt, and her own answered. It sped. It felt like it was slipping from her grasp, and that she'd never catch her heart, never pin it down, never keep it safe. She did not want to keep it safe. She said, Why can't you see that people care for you? She said, I care for you. I know that you care. But, he searched her face, anyone would, for a friend. You're more than a friend. On the battlefield, you stayed. Of course I did. You have a strong sense of honour. You always have. I think you think you owe me something. I stayed because I love you. He flinched and looked away. You don't mean that. Yes, I do. The night outside seemed to swell against the tent. The lamp smelled like a hot stone. His face slowly opened. He touched her hand as it pressed against his heart. His caress was light, secret, almost unsure of her knuckles, the thin tendons as strong as bone. She felt him become sure. There was no sound when he kissed her. None when she unthreaded the ties of his shirt and found his skin. He grasped her dagger belt, flexed his fingers once around the leather, then simply held on. He whispered something into her mouth that was almost a word. It lost its shape, became something else. 
he let go. She heard the brush of linen as he drew the shirt over his head, his fingertips grazing the tense sloped ceiling as if for balance. His ribs were bound with gauze, his body marked by scars. Old ones, badly healed and raised, others pink and fresh. His shoulders bore pale gouges. They looked like sets of claws, almost deliberate, like tattoos. Curious, she touched them. He bit his lip. That hurts. No. What is this? What happened? I'll tell you, he said. Later. His hand strayed over her shirt, which was eastern as Aaron's was with no collar, threadbare in places, frayed at the neck. He worried the cloth there, rubbing it between fingers and thumb. Then he drew her shirt open, and she felt as if reality had grown larger and tremulous, a drop of water on the point of a pin. Kestrel, I've never... She whispered that this was new to her, too. There was a long pause. Are you certain you want... Yes. Because, Arryn, maybe you... Arryn. She laughed, and then so did he, aware that they'd already found the bed. Words had fallen away. Maybe the words lay on the earth, nestled among clothes, curled into the undone dagger belt. Maybe later, language would be recovered and pieced together, made to make sense. But not now. Now there was touch and taste and sound. When he eased into her, she was glad for the burning lamp, the fuzzy glow of it on his skin, the way it showed the black fall of his wet hair, the flesh and scars that made him. She didn't look away. Later, when they were quiet, he looked down at her where she lay, stretched out alongside her. Aaron propped himself up on one elbow, I think that I'm not awake. His fingertips floated over her. Nose, eyelashes, messy braid, shoulder. Beautiful. She smiled. Like you. Aaron made a sceptical cough, scrunched his face. He found the end of her braid and paintbrushed it across her cheek. It's true, she told him. You never believe me when I say it. The lamp's wick fizzed and sparked in its oil. It would soon go out. I love your eyes, she said. I have from the first. They're common. No, they're not. She traced his scarred face. This, he shivered. I love this. She bit him on the jaw. And this, she continued to touch him. Really? Yes. This, too. Not quite a question. That, too. She felt laughter travel through him, and something else, quieter and more intense. Your mouth, she said, is not bad. Not bad? Quite tolerable. He cocked one brow. I'll show you. They stopped talking. Chapter 35 In the morning, when Roshar saw their faces, he rolled his eyes. I want my tent back, he said. Kestrel laughed. She loaded Javelin's saddlebags, listening to the sounds of the army breaking camp. Clatters and thumps, someone urinating against a tree, the jingle of horse tack, the sifting grate of dirt kicked over a fire. Javelin flicked his tail. Nearby, Arryn was checking the hooves of his horse, a mare, one that took a moment for Kestrel to recognise. His previous horse had been left on the beach. This one's master was probably dead. Arryn adjusted the saddle's girth. As he ran his hands again over the horse, he said... Why do you think we haven't been attacked yet? She slowly buckled an open saddlebag. He said, 
This isn't what I want to ask you. He had sleepless eyes, his mouth a little swollen, the deeply tanned skin somehow burnished. Kestrel thought that she too must look like this, polished by desire, the way a river stone holds a lustre from having been made so smooth. I wish, he caught himself, and from the way he was looking around the busy camp, she thought that Arryn had almost said that he wished there was no war, or that they could lose themselves in each other without losing everything. But this wasn't entirely true for him, or for her, and she needed to win the war as much as he did. We haven't been attacked because my father's strengthening his foothold on the beach, supplying his troops, recovering too. It was a costly victory for them. He doesn't need to eliminate us now, when his forces will be stronger later. But he'll move soon. He'll take territory along the road all the way to the city. Also, Arryn looked at her. Also, she said reluctantly, he thinks he'll conquer the city with little trouble. We're herding ourselves into a trap. Yes, but... He waited. It buys us time, she said. If we are retreating instead of simply seeming like we're retreating, and his scouts report this, then when we're able to find a way to counterattack, it will catch him off guard. Sometimes it's better to do instead of pretend, especially if you don't intend to follow what you're doing to the conclusion your enemy expects. What do do you intend? She stroked Javelin's nose. I'm not sure. Black powder is the biggest problem. If the Valorians didn't have so much of it, we'd stand a chance against them. Well, what? I could destroy it. He rubbed the back of his neck and crinkled his brow as he listened to her explain what she had in mind. He didn't like it. You know I'll go anyway. He left his horse, dusting his hands free of the dirt from the animal's hooves. When he came close, it felt as if she'd come in out of the cold and stood next to a fire. Aaron touched the dagger at her hip and ran a thumb over the symbol on its hilt, the circle within a circle. The God of Souls, Kestrel said. It's his symbol. Hers he corrected gently. Kestrel wasn't sure how long she'd known what the symbol meant. Maybe for a long time, or maybe she'd only realised it last night. It was the kind of knowledge that, once it enters you, seems like it's lived there forever. Her expression was soft and entranced and puzzled. Do you feel changed? I feel changed. Yes she whispered. He smiled. It's strange. And so it was. We could reach Lerilyn by nightfall, she said, if we press the horses. Will you come with me? Ah, Kestrel, that's something you never need to ask. The sun was gone when they reached the wind-twisted bushes that hedged the beach, Beyond were the fires of the enemy's camp. The blue-black air smelled of smoke and salt. Kestrel cleaned her Valorian armour, strapped on a traditional-looking dagger she had taken from the arms supply wagon, and wordlessly handed Aaron the one he'd made for her. I don't love my role in this particular mission, he said. It's mostly watching you saunter into danger. You forget that. That's nothing. You could get hurt, he blinked. No. You don't ever fear for yourself. Not for something like this. Then what? He studied his hands. Sometimes I think of who I was. As a boy, I talk to him. Slowly, she said, like you do to your God. It's different. Or maybe I think about him like my God thinks about me. I've made promises to the child. I worry I won't be able to keep them. 
What have you promised? Revenge. You'll have it. Aaron nodded, but more in simple acknowledgement than actual confidence. She looked at him through the smoky night, just light enough to see his expression and dark enough that his body smudged into the shadows. Soon night would truly fall. Waves folded and unfolded against the shore. We should wait for the moon to rise, she said, before we go down to the camp. And what? he murmured. Will we do while we wait? She brought his fingers to her lips so that he could feel her smile. His hand travelled the length of her braid and toyed with the leather string that bound it. He untied the knot. The sound of it coming undone was as soft as a breath. He unravelled her hair and brought her close. When the moon was high, Kestrel and Aaron gathered what they needed and made their way down to the beach, keeping close to the ragged bushes, blending in with their darkness. They waited, crouched near the edge of camp, where they could see the supply wagons, their domed canvas covers as pale as mushrooms in the moonlight. Finally, a sentry on his rounds walked close to their hiding spot. In one swift movement, Aaron surged up, clamped a hand over the sentry's mouth and dragged him down to the sand. Not a sound, Aaron hissed at the sentry, the point of his dagger pricking the hollow behind the man's ear. Aaron forced the sentry's face to turn up to the moon, eyes wide, skin strained and white. Tell us which wagon holds the black powder, the sentry shook his head. Do you remember, Aaron whispered, the punishment for runaway slaves? No? Let me remind you. He lightly drew his dagger over the man's ear, down the tip of his nose. Which wagon? The Valorian shook his head again, but this time his gaze jerked in the direction of one of the larger wagons. Aaron glanced at Kestrel. Enough? his eyes asked. Yes, she mouthed, but don't, she whispered, ill at the sight of the sentry pressed down in the sand, his eyes as dark as her childhood friends, as that of any Valorian child. They were gleaming, glassy with the kind of fear a child eventually learns how to hide. But death will do that. It makes you unlearn all you know. Don't, she told Aaron again. He hesitated, then slammed the pommel of his dagger against the man's head, knocking him unconscious. Be swift, Aaron told her. She cut into the small bag of black powder tied to her waist. She felt grit flow thinly from the hole. Then she straightened and walked into the camp. She kept her head down, her tight braid trailing over one shoulder. Her face was dirty, she reminded herself as she passed campfires. She was changed. Her hair had reddened, was redder still by firelight. No one would recognise her, surely. Not in armour, not like this, with no trace of cosmetics, no finery, no silk or jewels or glittering gold engagement mark. She was not herself, she was simply one of them, just another Valorian. But her throat was dry, and her stomach shrank into a stone. The wagons weren't far off. To reassure herself, she passed her fingers through the little stream of black powder from her bag and thought about how it traced a line between Aaron and her. When she reached the wagon the sentry had glanced at, Kestrel let out a slow breath, she peered inside and saw, in the halo of moonlight through canvas, fat mounds of sacks tied with twine. What are you doing? someone demanded. Slow, very slowly, squeezing all of her sudden fear into the sound of her boot shifting in the sand, Kestrel turned. It was a guard. The woman looked Kestrel over. What? the woman said. Does a scout like you want with that wagon? 
the small sack at Kestrel's waist felt light. It had leaked nearly all of its black powder. Could the guards see it in the shadows? I'm verifying inventory. Why? The words sprang to her lips before she even fully remembered them. For the glory of Valoria! The guard drew slightly back, startled to hear the phrase that indicated a military mission whose details couldn't be discussed. But a scout! She stared again at Kestrel's armour, whose colour and material, leather unlike the steel for officers, indicated her low rank. Kestrel shrugged. The empty black powder bag lay slack against her hip. It's not for you to question the general. Of course, the guard said immediately, and stepped aside as Kestrel moved to walk past her, and tried not to walk too quickly, but wanted to, wanted to run all the way up into the dunes. Then it was as if a cold marble hand rested on her shoulder, pressing her down into her boot prints. There was no hand, she told herself. No one touched her. Move. But she couldn't. Just as she couldn't help the way her gaze lifted and saw, not fifteen paces away, her father standing in the orange light of a fire. It cracked her open. It hatched some creature of an emotion. Two-headed, lumpy, leather wings, unnumbered limbs. A thing that should never have been born. Kestrel hadn't known until she saw her father's face how much she still loved him. Wrong that she felt this way. Wrong that love could live with betrayal and hurt and anger. Hate, she corrected herself. No, a voice whispered back, the voice of a small girl. Her father didn't see her. He was looking at the fire. His eyes were shadowed, his mouth sad. Trajan, someone called from across the camp. Kestrel saw the silver-headed man approach. Soldiers fell away from him like shed water. The emperor approached his general, whose face changed, becoming full of something older than she was. Firelight striped the emperor's cheek as he leaned to murmur in her father's ear. She saw that slight smile and remembered the pleasure the emperor took in his games, how he could make a move and wait for months to see its final play. But there was no scheme in his expression now. Her father answered him. She stood too far away to hear what they said to one another, yet she was close enough to see that their friendship was solid and true. Kestrel looked away. She walked toward the dunes, careful not to retrace her steps and risk smudging the line of powder that, once lit, must burn directly from Arryn to the wagon. The bushes where Arryn waited were thick black scribbles. Her cheeks were wet. Valorian soldiers didn't look as she passed. She wiped her face. Sand hissed under her hurried boots. She left the camp behind. She'd almost reached the bushes when she heard someone following her, pacing the sand, right in her tracks, coming up close. She slowed, hand on her dagger, heart in her mouth. She turned. Kestrel? Chapter 36 Her hand dropped from her dagger's hilt. Ferex. He stood awkwardly in the moonlight, long and slopy, shoulders narrow, eyes large, his fair hair ruffled and feathery. When he met her gaze, he let out such a large breath that his chest seemed to cave in. I was so worried for you, he said. Kestrel crossed the sand and flung herself into his open arms. I tried to help, he murmured. I know. I sent a key to the prison camp. I got it. I'm ashamed of myself. Ferex, I couldn't do more. I wanted to. I should have. She pulled back, stared at him. That key was everything to me. Not enough. My father, 
Did he find out? Her blood went cold. Did he punish you? He talked as if he knew it was me. Well, dear boy, have you heard? A prisoner tried to escape the North. Somehow. How, do you think? She laid her filthy little hands on a key. Never acknowledging that the prisoner was you. Never accusing me of having sent the key. Just watching and smiling. He said, he told me that the prisoner was tortured. Killed. And I... Varex's face twisted. I'm all right. I'm here. He didn't look convinced. What did he do to you? Varex flopped one hand. Nothing. Tell me. Nothing that mattered. I think he enjoyed it. That I knew. That I tried. Failed. I have my spies in the court. I must. And when you disappeared, I found out too quickly what had happened to you. He wanted me to know. All the while, he said nothing of your absence, only informed me of the story he'd tell the court, and that I'd be sailing to the Southern Isles. He said he'd watch over Risha while I was away. Varex thrust his hands in his pockets, slumped his shoulders. He said, I know how you care for the Eastern Princess. Did he? No. His voice went hard. He knows that if he did anything to her, I'd kill him. She's safe in the capital. What are you doing here? Varex, you're no fighter. He laughed a little. I'd have said the same of you. Yet look at you. You knew it was me. You have this way when you walk. You stride. I didn't expect to see the Emperor here, let alone you. I'm mostly here to be looked at. The Emperor came with me in tow for the morale of the troops. There have been a few military setbacks in this campaign. He peered at her. You're doing? She wasn't sure how to answer. For the first time, it occurred to her that it might not matter that Varex was her friend. Maybe he would seize her anyway. Maybe he'd cry an alarm. Maybe he couldn't be her friend when it seemed so obvious that she was his people's enemy. She took a step back, then stopped when hurt flickered across his face. I think, Varex said gently, that your father knows it's your doing. My father? I didn't make much of it before, but after the Valorian victory on the beach, an officer mentioned the ambush along the road near Erelith, said things about Arryn, what would be done to him if caught alive. Kestrel's stomach twisted. Said something about that slave with the clever tricks. In Varex's pause, she could hear the foulness of what he didn't repeat. Your father made no reply at first. Then, not his tricks. Not his alone. And the officer smirked and said, You mean the no-nosed barbarian? But I don't think now that the general did mean the eastern prince. After the battle on the beach, I saw him searching, he went among the prisoners taken. He turned over bodies in the sand. The way he looked. Don't tell him you saw me. Maybe he should know. Varex, don't. Swear. Worriedly, he scanned her face. You have my word, but... He raked a hand through his fine hair, then peered at her through narrowed eyes. He lifted the empty bag at her hip dropped it, rubbed his fingers and thumb together, and sniffed the unmistakable odour of black powder. A slow horror stole over his face. What exactly are you doing here? Just let me walk away. Forget you saw me, please. I can't do that. You'd make me responsible for whatever you're going to do. No one will get hurt if you keep people away from the supply wagons. Make up some excuse. No one will die. Tonight, maybe. What about tomorrow, when we need what you plan to destroy? 
You're after the black powder, aren't you? She said nothing. Softly, he said, I could stop you so easily right now. If you did, you'd hand your father yet another victory, he sighed. The awful thing is, part of me wants to please him, despite everything. No, please don't, you can't. But I do want to, and I hate myself for wanting to please him, and I can't think of a way to do it without hurting you. Maybe you could think of a way, but would never tell me. You'd fall into my father's hands again, and your father's hands, and I'd never forgive myself. Kestrel told him that she would miss him. She told him quietly, as the sound of waves pushed and pulled at the night, that she wished he were her brother, that she was sorry and grateful to know him. There was no sound other than the waves as she walked away. When she reached Arryn, he released the parted bushes and lowered the eastern crossbow he'd held cranked at the ready. You wouldn't have, she stated. Arryn looked at her, he certainly would. Verex is my friend. Arryn unloaded the crossbow. His fingers were trembling. You greeted him like a friend, he acknowledged. But they both looked back toward the camp. The slender shadow of the Valorian prince slowly retraced his steps. He dissolved into the camp's firelight, a good distance from the supply wagons. Kestrel untied the empty sack from her waist and dusted her hands, her clothes. Matches, now! Aaron's hands still weren't sure of themselves. He fumbled with the box. She took it, struck a match, and touched it to the trail of black powder she'd left behind. It sparked, lit, and burned down the line. They ran. The explosion blossomed over the beach. They stayed off the road as they rode through the dark. Their pace was slow. Moonlight painted the land. They were silent, but Kestrel knew that it couldn't be due to the same thing, because she hadn't told Aaron that she'd seen her father in the Valorian camp. The sight of him lingered with her. Her love for him closed within her like a fist. Nervous, bruised. She despised it. Wasn't it the love of a beaten animal slinking back to its master? Yet here was the truth. She missed her father. It seemed too awful to tell Aaron. But finally, when they stopped to sleep, not bothering with a tent, just bedding down in a hollow they'd trampled in the tall grass with their boots, Aaron spoke. He slid a hand under her tunic to touch her bare back, then stopped. Is this all right? She wanted to explain that she hadn't thought she'd ever bear anyone's touch on her scarred back, that it should revolt him and revolt her. Yet his touch made her feel soft and new. Yes. He pushed the shirt up, seeking the lash marks, tracing their length. She let herself feel it and shivered and thought of nothing. But a tension grew. He was still, but for his hand. Kestrel said, What's wrong? Your life would have been easier if you had married the Valorian prince. She drew herself up so that she could face him. The scent of black powder clung to them both. His skin smelled like a blown-out candle. But not better, she said. It was the next day's end when they caught up with Roshar's army, which had stopped, oddly, at a time too early to make camp and rather late for a moment's rest. More than that, it was the uncertainty of the soldiers that gave the halt a strange feeling. They looked as if they'd had no orders at all. They held ranks, but loosely, and were murmuring among themselves, armour still buckled, horses saddled, Several remained mounted. A Harani soldier toyed with her horse's reins. A Dacron eyed her as if he wished his horse had reins, so that he could do something with his empty hands. 
When Arryn and Kestrel rode up to the vanguard, all eyes lifted. Faces turned to Arryn, seeking an explanation, relieved because here, at last, was an answer. But Arryn didn't even understand the question. What has happened? he asked the two nearest soldiers on their horses. Someone came for our prince, the Dacron said. Arryn glanced at Kestrel, alert to the hesitation in the Dacron's voice. Arryn wondered if he needed to translate for her. Someone took him away, she asked the man in his language. The soldier clicked his teeth. No. But I heard that his face became terrible, truly, that no one could look at it. Some worry that she, she, brings news of the war's end, that we're to abandon the campaign and go home. The soldier glanced sideways at Arryn. Some hope for it. Your queen? Arryn asked. But it was not, in fact, the queen who had come for her brother. Chapter 37 Roshar was waiting alone outside his tent. Kestrel saw what the soldier had meant about Roshar's face. She'd grown used to the prince's mutilations, she rarely noticed them any more. But now, an emotion so scored his features that his face became pure in its damage, a mask of loss, twisted with anger and shame. Arryn went to him, eyes wide with concern. He spoke swiftly in Dacron, what was wrong, what had happened. My sister won't speak with me, Roshar cleared his throat. Not without you, his gaze flicked from Arryn to Kestrel. Both of you. Then Kestrel remembered that Roshar had more than one sister. The three of them entered the tent, the prince last, shoulders tight, eyes roaming everywhere except to where Risha stood near the tent's centre, her Valorian braids gone. Her black hair was cut close to the skull in the eastern style, her eyes rimmed with royal colours, her limbs lithe, the air in the tent was hot and dense. Sister, Roshar began, then faltered. She ignored him. Her gaze went to Kestrel, who didn't understand the young woman's presence here, or the animosity toward her brother, whom Risha must not have seen since having been taken hostage by the Empire as a child. I've come to bargain, Risha said. Visibly hurt, her brother said, I would give you anything. Not with you. I am so sorry, Risha, little sister. I trust you, she said to Arryn. As for this one, she tipped her chin at Kestrel. Verex holds her in high regard, Roshar said. I regret every day since I saw you last. What do you regret most? This? She gestured at his mutilations. No. How you let our older sister persuade you? Yes. Or when you saw the Valorians take me? Yes. Maybe it was when you explained to a child that she wouldn't be gone long, that she must pretend to be surprised when she's taken hostage. All she has to do is kill one man. Kestrel felt Arryn's tension, the way he looked at the prince. Arryn's worry was plain, his hands still at his sides, yet slightly open, as if his friend might shatter and Arryn needed to be ready to catch the pieces. Could it be so hard to kill a man? Risha continued, especially when we consider her talent. Look at the little girl's grace, her skill with a blade, a prodigy, surely, never before seen in one so young. Yes, the assassination of the Valorian Emperor should be easy for her. Then Kestrel understood. Roshar said, I regret it all. I have wondered over the years whether you were weak to let my sister rule you, or simply stupid. 
I didn't think about what would happen to me after I killed the emperor. Brother, I thought about it when I walked the halls of the imperial palace, when I learned their language, played childhood games with their prince. I thought about what the Valorians would do to the little girl who murdered their emperor. A pressure tightened Kestrel's lungs. Her father, when he had refused to be her father any more, had transformed into something else. A block of opaque glass, maybe. She wanted to heft the weight of his betrayal and show it to Risha, to ask if it looked and weighed the same as what the princess carried, if it ever got any lighter or could diminish like ice. Yet Kestrel also saw the ruined expression in Roshar's eyes. Maybe she shouldn't pity him, yet she did. Arryn said, Name what you want. Risha settled into a teak chair. I will never kill Verex's father, but... She flipped her hand at the three of them. You could, with my help. Get rid of the Emperor, and you can win this war without open battle. Wait, Kestrel said, cautious, focus now. She said, you're not even supposed to be here. Varex said you were safe at court. At the sound of Varex's name, some of the anger left Risha. Varex had left. There was nothing to hold me there. I escaped. And you found your way here? So easily? The princess shrugged. It's not hard to find safe passage if you're willing to kill for it. In Harani, Arryn asked Kestrel, what are you thinking? She noticed the switch in language and recognised that Arryn believed it was safe to speak in Harani, but she didn't risk an answer in front of Risha. She didn't say that General Trajan could have sent the embittered Eastern princess with tempting bait. Kestrel feared a trap. What kind of help are you offering? I can give you a location where the Emperor will be, separate from the army, with a light guard. How did you come by this information? The court. Kestrel didn't like this. It was too easy. You still haven't said what you want out of this bargain. Risha kept her eyes on Arryn. Promise that Verex won't be hurt. Protect him. Startled, defensive, Arryn said, I don't wish the Valorian prince any harm. But Roshar's face changed, and Kestrel suddenly realised why. No, she told him, her voice rising. You mustn't. His death wouldn't serve you. You should want him to inherit the Empire. He'd be a friend to the East. Doesn't matter, Roshar said. Our queen will smash the Empire to pieces if she can. Killing the Emperor might win the war. Verex might become a political ally. But if he inherits Valoria, that country will always be a threat to us. And to you, Arryn. Someone else would step into Varex's place, Kestrel argued. If the prince died, the Senate would elect a new emperor. Arryn's grey eyes went flat. It'd be the Valorian general, Roshar shrugged. Unless we eliminate him as well. Knock down all the principal pieces in Borderlands and what's left for your opponent. Surrender. You forget an important piece in this game, Risha said. Me. Roshar's shoulders tensed. Kestrel felt a growing disquiet. Verex and I would marry, said the princess. An alliance between East and West, Roshar said slowly. Kestrel sought Arryn's gaze. When he met her eyes, she couldn't read them. Not so good for you, little Herani, Roshar told Arryn. Your peninsula would get lost in the middle. The risk had always been there, even if they won the war, that Heron would be retaken by the west or dwindle into the east. But now, 
Kestrel saw it as if seeing the future, how a marriage between the Empire and Dacra could lead to one power ruling the entire continent. Heron would vanish. Decide, Risha said, or I leave. My information for Verex's safety, yes or no? Arryn met Kestrel's gaze, grim mouth, hooded eyes asking whether this was worth it. She thought about the Emperor's hand on her father's shoulder, the key Verex had sent to the northern prison. A friend, a good heart. But Roshar wasn't wrong. Kestrel knew what her father would choose in her place. She realised that she'd come to rely on his voice in her head, that it had saved her on the battlefield. Even now, the very thought of his advice was soothing, even as being so soothed repulsed her. It didn't matter what her father would choose. She was not her father. Yes, Kestrel said. I agree. Then I do too, said Arryn. Roshar gazed at his hands. No one can promise anyone safety. Never, much less in war. We can promise to try, Arryn told him. And you can shield him from the Dacran Queen. Roshar nodded, but distractedly, with a disbelieving wince, as if someone had presented him with a portrait where his features were whole, his mutilations erased, and he had no words to express how wrong this vision of him was. I overheard the Senate leader say that if Valoria succeeded in seizing the beach, the Emperor would move inland with a small contingent and take the Scythia estate. Risha said. The manor there is luxurious, Aaron said, but it has nothing strategically interesting for the emperor or the army. Vineyards. The grapes won't even be ripe this time of year. There's little to be gained in terms of supplies. The estate is north of the road to the city, not convenient as a base for attack. Kestrel, however, knew the emperor. But the manor is beautiful? Arryn lifted one shoulder. The stained glass windows were well known before the war. There are rooms that seem to be made of coloured light, or so it was said. I wouldn't know, I've never seen it. The Emperor enjoys beauty. Arryn's hand twitched, as if he'd meant to touch, compulsively, the scar that ran deep into his left cheek, but had stopped himself in time. It wrenched Kestrel's heart to see him remember how he'd been attacked by the Emperor's minion, his face sliced open. She hadn't been there when it happened. Still, she saw it now as if she'd been a bystander, paralysed, robbed of sound, her throat raw, bones like lead. And she saw herself in her suite in the Imperial Palace, dressed in red, her shoulders laced with golden wire, Kestrel had forgotten this. It came to her, the tight, gorgeous bodice, folds of crimson samite. The emperor had selected her wedding dress. He had selected her, had cut her from the cloth of her home, then stitched her into place beside his son. He had embroidered how she'd look and who she'd become. I have chosen you, Kestrel, and will make you into everything my son cannot be. Someone fit to take my place. It was difficult for Kestrel to move, as if she had indeed become a cloth doll, the stitches drawn tight. She touched Aaron's arm, felt how the muscles had hardened. You think that he seeks only to destroy? Yes, he muttered. Beauty moves him. He destroys it only when he can't possess it. I asked myself, the emperor whispered in her ear, whether it was really possible that you might betray your country so easily, especially when it had been practically given to you. He loves to shape things. A remembered helplessness shrouded her, the prince and his sister faded in her vision, were present but unimportant. She felt strange, 
Her blood prickled as if something were growing inside her. Every piece in place, arranged to his satisfaction. It's why he enjoys games. You know, don't you, how a game with a perfect line of play becomes beautiful? Yes, a growing thing, thorny, a briar. Arryn's expression changed. She saw how he read her stillness. She wondered if she'd gone pale. Anxiety stole over his features. Kestrel, can I have a word with you? Outside the tent, night had come. He cupped her face in his hands. You don't look right. I'm fine. No, you look like part of you has disappeared. Like you're not really here. Like... His hands fell away. You do when you're plotting something. Which was how Kestrel realised that she was plotting something. That growing briar inside her was an idea. Kestrel. She blinked, then noticed the hurt shape of his mouth. Arryn said, tell me. She started to speak. He cut through her first words. No deceiving, he said. I wouldn't. Not again, after everything. Don't keep me in the dark. Aaron, for someone who wants me to tell him something, you're doing an excellent job of not letting me speak. Oh, rubbing a forefinger and thumb into his eyes, he gave her a rueful look. Sorry. Risha could be a trap. We've no proof of her true allegiance, and while I know she cares for Varex, this might only make her firmly on Valoria's side. This story of the Emperor at the Scythia Manor could be a distraction. Worse, it could lure us into an ambush. But I also believe that the Emperor would leave the battlefield to stay in a luxurious manor known for its stained glass windows. He's let my father fight his battles for two decades. As Varex said, the Emperor is here only for show. Valoria is likely to win this war, and given our loss at Lerilan, its path to seize Heron's city is reasonably easy. Having destroyed some of their black powder helps us, but they still have the greater numbers and their tactical position is strong. Why should the Emperor not quit the army camp for a feather bed and a few of the vineyards? It would be like him. Then I'll lead a small team there. Assassinate him. Death will guide me. No, I have a better plan for how to win this war. She told him what she had in mind, then returned to the tent to ask Roshar for his help. Chapter 38 in the rosy light of morning, Aaron raked a fistful of dry grass and scattered the thin yellow blades. Again. Kestrel, who sat near him, glanced up from what she was doing. She lifted one brow. So he stopped. He knew it was pure anxiety, that if he didn't do something with his hands, they'd tremble. Her hands were steady. She dipped a skinny paintbrush she'd made from horsehair, a twig, and twine into the small vial resting on a wide board that had become an impromptu table. A bite and sting set lay spread across the board, the tiles all face up. She flipped four of them and painted their blank backs. The liquid went on clear. Kestrel. Almost done. I worry the Emperor won't agree. I think he will, but the stakes will amuse him. He'd gamble the outcome of a war? Maybe, for the pleasure of beating me. She laid the paintbrush on the board. But he won't win. She turned a snake tile onto its face and moved it close to one that she'd painted. She studied the two blank ivory backs. They looked nearly identical, save that the painted one had a slight shine. She lightly tapped the paintbrush's wooden end against the painted tile. It left no trace. The tile had dried. Aaron's stomach was a wormy knot. This game could go badly. That's why I'm cheating. 
even with the marked tiles. It's a good plan. Yes, but he'll agree to play only if he believes the outcome won't matter, even if you win. That is what will amuse him. Your expectation that he'll keep his word. He won't. All part of the game. If anything goes wrong, he'll hurt you. Kestrel turned away from the board, saw him rake another fistful of grass. It sounded like cloth being ripped apart. Not this time, she said. Arryn smelled smoke from Roshar's pipe before he heard the prince approach from behind. The sun was going down. The sky looked candied. Pretty, the prince commented. Storm colours, one's coming. I was thinking. Arryn turned to glance at the prince, alert to his quiet tone. Roshar avoided his gaze, but his black eyes were large, glassy. Arryn was about to speak when Roshar cleared his throat and said, Now is a good time to remind you how generous I am. Arryn refused to be distracted into a meaningless conversation where Roshar simultaneously praised and mocked himself. He knew what troubled the prince. Give Risha time. She'll forgive you. Roshar continued as if he hadn't heard. The very soul of generosity. You ask for an ally in war, and lo, here I am. I dole out favours, even to your ghost. She asks, I give. What's more, I've selected five elite fighters to accompany her and my little sister to Sathaya's manor. Truly, I'm confident that Risha would be enough to keep Kestrel safe, but I thought you'd appreciate the extra protection. Arryn realised where this conversation was going, and it was as if the storm he'd predicted had already arrived. No, wait. A small team is best for infiltrating the manor, silently, efficiently, no more than seven people. Eight. Sorry, Arryn, you must remain with the army. You can't compel me to stay. Am I not your commander? The sky deepened. Its oranges and reds were resinous. Arryn's pulse leapt with anger. But this time, Roshar's voice came low. I need you. What? The air whooshed out of him. The Emperor might be in Sathaya. He might not. What we know for certain is that an entire Valorian army, whose forces vastly outnumber ours, will be travelling up that road with a general who will probably continue to fight regardless of what happens at Sithaya. Are we to bet everything on Kestrel's game? I say we deal with the Valorians. I say no retreat. You don't need me to fight a battle. Roshar tipped his head to one side, his shoulders shrugging, and opened his hands as if scattering seeds. The gesture, a Harani one used to indicate doubt, made Arryn angrier. You don't, Arryn insisted. You'd be fine without me. You're good at war. Roshar met his gaze. The green paint around the prince's eyes was fresh, his expression sober. You're better. He didn't like to tell her what Roshar had asked, but he did, focused on adjusting the small lamp they'd set on the canvas tarp that covered the dirt floor of his tent. The lamp didn't burn well, its oil was bad, it smoked. As he talked, he tinkered with the burner, the chimney. Then Aaron stopped, realising that he was close to destroying the thing between his hands. Kestrel sat up in the bedroll, unbound hair spilling over her bare shoulders. It was the colour of candlelight. She said, Roshar's right. Arryn struggled with his unease, didn't know what to say, dreaded blurting out the wrong thing. Finally, he settled on blunt truth. You're taking a big risk. I don't want you to have to do it alone. She sat in profile to him, 
Her hair had slid to curtain most of her face, but she shoved it back, meeting his gaze with her own firm one. It will work. He thought of the bite and sting tiles carefully stowed in a velvet bag. He scrubbed the heel of his hand against his scarred cheek, saw Kestrel's quiet regard, how her expression changed the way a story does, subtle, with shifts of detail, revealing. It calmed him a little to see her intelligence, vivid and clear. I believe you, he said. I'll stay with the army. But it's strange to me that Rochard changed his mind. He was ready to retreat to the city. Seeing Risha changed him. Even so, it's hard to know what he really wants. Aaron explained how Rochard could lay claim to Heron, and in the eyes of his people he'd only be taking what was legally his. Kestrel said nothing at first. Then, it's not like you to question someone's friendship. With a nauseated jolt, Aaron thought of Cheat, who'd been his first friend after the invasion. Maybe I should. Maybe it would make you less yourself if you did. And you? Do you trust Rosha? She considered it. Yes. Aaron let out a resigned sigh. I do too, even if I shouldn't. Let the morning keep what belongs to the morning, Kestrel said, but as if she wasn't paying attention to what she said, then she blinked, her jaw tightened, she blew out the lamp. He drew her to him. What is it? he murmured, her heart beat against his palm. It just means that you shouldn't borrow tomorrow's problems. Deal with today's. But why does it upset you? It was something my father would say. She grew smaller in Aaron's arms. I can't face him. You won't have to, he promised. This he could do. Aaron sensed his god listening. He felt the god's ascent fall on him, light and warm like ash. Give him to me, said death. As Kestrel neared sleep, it occurred to Aaron that the emotion that spread through him, delicate and unable to be named at first because so unfamiliar, was peace. He held the feeling close before it could be lost. Chapter 39 The rain began the next morning and showed no signs of letting up, Mud sucked at Aaron's boots as he helped Kestrel ready her horse. The rain intensified, dropping down like little stones. Aaron squinted up at it. Terrible day to ride. He hated to see her go. She wiped water from her face, glancing over at Risha, whose head was tipped back under the rain, eyes closed. Not for everyone, Kestrel said and the rain will make it less likely a Valorian scout will notice that a small band is riding from camp. True, the middle distance was a grey fog. Aaron raked dripping hair off his brow. He tried to be all right. His nerves sparked the way a blade does against the grinder. Kestrel touched his cheek. The rain is good for us. Come here. She tasted like the rain, cool and fresh and sweet. Her mouth warmed as he kissed her. He felt the way her clothes stuck to her skin. He forgot himself. She murmured, I have something for you. You needn't give me anything. It's not a gift. It's for you to keep safe until I return. She placed a speckled yellow feather on his palm. The rain fell in a veil behind her. The ground oozed. Mud splattered Aaron's trousers as he helped load a supply wagon. He was worried. He kept thinking about the bite and sting set in Kestrel's saddlebag, and the mud made his work sluggish. He grew frustrated. Oh, I don't know, said Death, slightly smug. I like the mud. Aaron stopped what he was doing. You do? 
There was no reply other than the rain. Arryn considered his army. He considered the generals. A strategy slowly formed, one that released an emotion close to pleasure. It was, he realised, the promise of revenge, right at the tips of his fingers. In the prince's tent, the rain loudly percussive against the canvas, Roshar studied the map marked by Arryn. Your people will fight better in the rain, Arryn said. The rain might end by the time our army is in position, but the mud will remain. Think of that heavy Valorian armour the higher ranks wear. We wear leather. Most of them will flounder. Not on a paved road. Roshar wasn't challenging Arryn's strategy, just prodding it to test its solidity. Their cavalry is superior. The general will take into account the soggy terrain on either side of the road. Armed infantry fares worse than horses in mud. They'll try to flank us with cavalry. Yes. Arryn tapped the map where he'd made notches on the even ground that bordered the road and ran open and smooth to the forest on either side. Exactly. What is it like, Kestrel asked Risha as they rode, to be gifted with weapons? Coolly, the princess said, You've no proof that I am. But Kestrel remembered an archery contest on the palace lawn, and how Risha aimed arrows with studied mediocrity, until one final arrow punched so hard into the target's centre that it drove through the canvas halfway up its shaft. I used to wish I were talented that way. Then I didn't. Now I do again. Risha shrugged. It's gained me a little. Rosha was even younger than we are when he brought you into Valorian territory. When you were captured, betrayed, you didn't agree to go with him? The princess shifted in her saddle. I was a mere child and eager to prove myself. Children seek to please. They try so hard. My brother and sister used that against me. Rosha has suffered for it. And so? Risha twisted in the saddle to meet Kestrel's gaze. The princess's eyes burned. Her brown skin was sleek with rain, her full mouth pinched. You could speak with him, Risha snorted. You mean forgive? Forgiveness is so squishy, like all this mud. Kestrel thought of her father's firelit face on Lerilyn Beach. It drags you down, Risha said. You know this. She had an uneasy feeling of not knowing what Risha would say next, but already not wanting to hear it. You, who seek your own father's death. The bodies lay tumbled in a ditch, not far from the Scythia vineyards. The rain had washed away any tracks. Still, Kestrel understood the story. It leached into her. How the Emperor's company had seized the manor and dragged the Harani who lived there out onto the grounds, forced them forward. A girl in the ditch had lost her shoe. Her little foot was black with mud. The shoe. Kestrel searched for it in the rain, feeling a growing panic and need, as if finding a lost shoe could blot away the image of ashen corpses, the way a dead woman still gripped the child's hand, the inching insects. A shoe could take away the smell, the rot of it strong in the rain. A shoe could keep down the bile that rushed up Kestrel's throat. But when she found the shoe, stuck in the root of a tree, the inner leather sole still held the shape of the girl's foot. Kestrel could feel its imprint. The shoe took away none of the horror, it planted it deep in the bottom of Kestrel's belly, as solid as a grown man's kick. They crouched in the stubby vineyards with the other five Dacron soldiers. Risha eyed the manor's kitchen yard, the house's weakest entry point. Several of the house's windows glowed through the night rain. Kestrel licked her sour lips and gripped the satchel, 
she imagined the game tiles rattling inside their velvet bag. She remembered dining with the emperor, a dessert served with a disintegrating sugar fork. How encounters with him had always felt like that, as though every tool at her disposal was crumbling in her grasp. She remembered how, on the imperial palace grounds after a hunt, she'd realised that the emperor would steal or maim her dog simply because she loved it. My father needs for you to love him best, Ferex had said. You need to watch yourself, he'd said. If you play against my father, you'll lose. A light hand touched her arm. I don't know you well, Risha's voice was low, but I know what Verex has told me about you, and what I see for myself. You don't need to be gifted with a blade. You are your own best weapon. Kestrel stared back at Risha, who was almost pure shadow, a mere glint of eyes. Kestrel felt a slow, slight throb, a shimmer in the blood. She knew it well. Her worst trait, her best trait, the desire to come out on top, to set her opponent under her thumb. A streak of pride, her mind ringed with hungry rows of fox-like teeth. Later, at dawn, when the Emperor pulled Kestrel's dagger from its sheath and touched its tip to her throat, she remembered that Scythia's manner had always been a trap. The question had only been whether it was a trap she set for the Emperor or one that she'd fall into. Kestrel touched Risha's hand. Thank you. The seven of them moved through the dark to the house. The dawn broke bright, clear sky, a sheen of water wavered over the road toward Lerilan, deeper in the cracks between paving stones. Arryn and Rosha had moved the army as quickly west as they could. They had reached the location Arryn had chosen. The first task, to unload the hundreds of sharpened staves Arryn had ordered made. The second, to drive them into the sodden earth bordering the road. The third, to set their sacks of gunpowder on the road, a snug and deadly little bundle. And the fourth, to wait, to try not to think about Kestrel, about how she must have already reached Sathaya by now, and might have already played bite and sting against the Emperor, and had won or lost. The seven of them wound their way through the night-shadowed corners of Sathaya's manor, Risha moved with ethereal fluidity, and when they encountered a pair of Valorian soldiers stationed in a hallway, her knife split their skin as smoothly as if cutting through cream. The Valorians made no sound. It was quiet enough to hear the drip of blood. They accessed the upper floors and began checking bedrooms. Kestrel knew where they'd be situated. Hirani architecture usually had bedrooms face east or west. Risha crept in alone, her posture stiffening with annoyance when the other Dacrons made as if to accompany her. She let out a low hiss. They didn't follow. She'd return, her blade wetter than before. Enough of this, she whispered. We must go quietly, Kestrel reminded her. We need to get to the Emperor's room without waking the entire house. We can't fight them all, Risha snorted. I can. The princess's impatience wore thin. The next time they encountered Valorian guards, again a pair of them, she let a Dacron soldier shoot one of them with a crossbow, but pulled the other Valorian out of the quarrel's path at the same time that her other hand came down on the woman's mouth. Risha touched her knife to the fragile skin beneath the woman's wide eye. Stay silent, Risha whispered, and you'll keep your eyes. Lead us to the Emperor's suite. The soldier led them to a broad door made of tiger maple, the wood smooth in the Harani style, with little carving other than the rippled door jam. An oil lamp glowed in the hallway's sconce. 
its stained glass casting a jeweled light over the wood's natural stripes. Here? Kestrel asked. Light glowed through the door's keyhole. The woman nodded. Risha killed her. The body slumped. Blood welled up to Kestrel's boots. She made herself remember the girl's lost shoe, the bite and sting set, Aaron's scar, the way he heard the god of death because he believed he had no one else. The small houses in the wheat fields, the bearing of her back to the cold tundra air, the way she had hoped that the nighttime drug would make her forget. Open the door, she whispered. One of the Dacron men, selected by Roshar for his skill at this, knelt and unfolded a leather-wrapped set of tools. Then he inserted two of them, long and thin like knitting needles, into the keyhole. He poked, then levered the tools until they heard the soft clunk of the lock's tumblers releasing. He eased the door open, softly, as if his hand were no more than a small gust of wind. Risha first and Kestrel behind her, they entered the suite's antechamber. They were attacked by the Emperor's personal guard, who had been waiting as they'd listened to the clicking of the picked lock. Arryn set the army into formation on the western road. He made the vanguard's ranks broad, running across the road and the bordering wet earth all the way up to the trees. Behind the vanguard, the centre ranks were confined to the road. Roshar's horse flicked its tail, shifting. The prince eyed the forest. Those trees turn this place into something resembling a ravine. We won't have much room to manoeuvre. Neither will they. The morning light was sheer and fresh, as pale as the flesh of a lemon. Aaron imagined squeezing it down his throat, it would taste like how he felt, stingingly alive. Kestrel couldn't count them, couldn't see how the guards carved open the bodies of the Dacron soldiers, couldn't fathom Risha's speed, the way the princess had shoved Kestrel against a wall, creating a halo of safety around her, the snick of Risha's knife against a windpipe, her swivel and dance, unerring strike, counter, Bodies thumped to the floor. Hold, someone called. I want to see. The Valorians pulled back. Risha's knife flicked blood as it arced through the air. She had no intention of obeying the voice. Kestrel caught her arm. The princess spun, her face frustrated, as if she'd been listening to a voice whose last words had been lost in the interruption. The Emperor stood at the threshold where the antechamber flowed into the rest of the suite, his posture light and easy. For a moment, there was no sound but the rain on the roof. You, he said wonderingly as his gaze found Risha, then Kestrel. His eyes widened in delight. And you, he laughed. The day blazed. The sun seemed to soar into the sky, all the way to its height. Aaron waited. Nothing. Waited. Nothing. He touched the hard leather shell of his armour, hidden beneath it, his chest, his lungs, skin, a speckled yellow feather tucked inside his tunic pocket, right above his heart. Forget the feather. Death said, you are the road, the sun, the sky, the horse beneath you. Comforted, Aaron said, the gods used to walk among us. True, Death said. Why did you leave? Ah, sweet child, it was your people who left us. Lady Kestrel, you look like a dirty little savage. What are you doing here? She tried to speak. Did you hope to murder me in my sleep? Her throat was too dry. Maybe you've come for court gossip. Surely the barbarian princess has told you everything of interest, no? Kestrel swallowed. She saw her hand gripping her dagger, 
the knuckles were white knobs. You want news of your father, I imagine. Let me tell you, he doesn't mourn you. Kestrel heard the emperor as if from far away. Doesn't miss you. He never did. You remember how little time he spent at home, how awkward he became in your company. You had to beg him to stay in the capital. Oh, yes, I heard. And here, a secret for you. He was relieved when you were sent north. I saw how a burden had been lifted from his shoulders. He looked lighter, younger, free. The emperor looked from her to Risha, to the Dacran soldiers, dead on the bloody floor. You're resourceful, Kestrel, I'll give you that. You survived the mines, the tundra, the war, thus far. You've made, his gaze flicked again to Risha, interesting allies. But my guard outnumbers you both, and it will take an instant for me to rouse the entire house. I don't have many regrets, but my decision to imprison rather than kill you smacks of squeamishness, or, shall I say, an unnecessary concern for your father's well-being. Do you know, he hasn't mentioned you once since he told me of your treason? He wouldn't, no matter what he feels. Regardless, the emperor said softly, I could have you killed right now, and he'd never know. And if he did, why would he care? What would the life of one dishonorable would-be assassin mean to him? I didn't come here to murder you. He bit back a thin smile. She said, I came to challenge you. Oh? One game of bite and sting. If I win, you'll end the war. Leave. Cross the sea with every last Valorian. Never return. The Emperor made a surprised half-laugh of a sound. He lightly traced the deepest line of his brow, then unfolded his hand in a flourish. What would I gain should I win? What you like. Whatever I can give you. He tapped one finger to his lips, considering... That's not much. I'm sure you can think of something. And if I agree and lose, you'd trust me to keep my word? A Valorian honours his word. Yes, he said, drawing out the word. He does. Risha goes free, no matter what the outcome. I'll wait here, said the princess, with your guards, if you like. She gave them a disdainful look, making clear that she thought little of their chances of survival if she chose to finish what she'd started. Until the game is done, Kestrel said, we play in private. You set quite a lot of terms, the Emperor said, but this particular one I wouldn't have any other way. So, you agree? I confess I'm curious. Do you agree? A fair warning. I'm better at this than you are. We shall see. Arryn heard a crash in the trees. A Harani scout. He ran to Arryn, his face shiny with sweat. The Valorians were coming. The Emperor led her to his bedroom, the summer hangings on the bed were gauzy, the sheets disturbed. She could see the dent left in a pillow by his head. The room smelled of his oils, powdery pepper, bitingly sweet balsam. Rain tapped the black window panes. Wash your face, he said. There was a mirrored basin in the corner. Kestrel did as ordered, though her face wasn't particularly dirty. She was startled by the stranger in the glass and tried not to stare at herself. She caught a glimpse of shocked, light eyes, made lighter by tanned and freckled skin. A strong face. 
She folded the towel and joined the emperor where he stood near an octagonal table. He had produced a bottle of wine and two glasses. I'll serve, she said, which made him give her a sleek look of amusement. She poured the red wine, but neither of them touched their glasses, and they both knew that the other suspected that some sleight of hand had poisoned the cup. Disarm, he said. I will if you do the same. He unbuckled his dagger and set it gently yet heavily on the table. Her fingers fumbled as she undid hers. The dagger Arryn had made her looked plain next to the Emperor's, but strong, like her unexpected face in the mirror. Interesting. The Emperor stroked it where it lay. A new acquisition? Perhaps this will be my prize when I win. If that's what you want, I haven't decided what I want. She opened the satchel, set the velvet bag of tiles on the table, and moved to sit. Not yet. He held out his hand. She gave him the satchel, which he examined. Satisfied that it contained nothing else, he dropped it to the floor, then said, You'll have no objection, I'm sure, if I make certain that you hide no weapons on your person. Her skin prickled. I give you my word that I don't. The word of a traitor is hardly to be trusted. So she stood rigid as his hands moved over her unarmoured body. They didn't linger, except when he pressed his fingers to her throat, and then pressed harder to feel her pulse jump and run. He said, You're welcome to do the same to me. No. Are you sure? He seemed to dare her to admit that she didn't want to touch him. I trust you. Well then, little liar, let's play. The approaching Valorian army shone in a silver river under the sun. Aaron looked through a spyglass. He couldn't find the general. There was a thin, whistling whine. Aaron lowered the spyglass. The whine stopped. A cry of pain. An arrow studded into a Harani soldier's throat. More arrows sped through the air. Valorian rangers were shooting at them from the trees on either side of the road. They sat. Kestrel, her back to the bed, loosened the velvet bag's tie and poured the tiles onto the table. She reached to mix the tiles, but as she had thought he might, the Emperor stopped her. Let's confirm that this set is standard, shall we? he said. He checked the tiles to account for their values. When he saw that the set showed the proper amount of each bite and sting tile, he turned them onto their faces and mixed them. His face was calm, but his gestures were eager. He touched each tile, but barely. He wanted to get to the game. Kestrel studied his smooth expression. He didn't seem to notice that four ivory tiles were shinier than the rest. The gloom of the late hour helped. He drew his tiles. Her stomach clenched to see the four shiny tiles left in the boneyard, from which she and the Emperor would pull tiles throughout the game. She drew her own hand. Aaron had warned her that when she had a high chance of winning, her very lack of tells showed her confidence. I don't think most people notice, he'd said. Your expression doesn't change. You've no tick or gesture. I just get the sense that there's an energy inside you I can't reach, and that if I did, it'd strike like lightning. She tried not to think about her plan, worrying that even the mere thought of it would show on her face. She felt her expression harden as clay does in a kiln. Play, Kestrel. She set down her first tile. The Emperor did the same. She found herself praying to Aaron's God. Please, let this be over soon. But she heard no answer. Stand your ground, Roshar shouted as arrows drove into the army. Eastern crossbows fired into the trees. 
Rosha ordered Zash, his second in command, to lead a company into the forest to the left of the road. Rosha would take another company to the right. We'll take care of the rangers. You, he said to Arryn, take command of the road. Arryn snagged the prince's shoulder. You'll get bogged down in the mud. The rangers will shoot everyone down on the open land before you reach the trees. Not much choice. Continue to return fire. The Dacran archers are plains people. They're good. They're not gods. They will be, to protect their prince. Then Rosha was gone, and Arryn snapped his attention back to the road, because the enemy was upon them, thundering down the road, almost here, almost here, here. As they played, the rain lessened and stopped. The glasses of wine sat untouched. The boneyard still held the four shiny tiles hidden among the others. It was the emperor's turn. He reached for a tile, then paused. Too much drama in his movements. He wasn't truly hesitant, or even pretending to be hesitant, but rather making an open mockery of hesitancy that he knew she'd recognise as such. Play your tile, her voice grated. I'm thinking. She said nothing. Don't you want to know what I'm thinking? He leaned back in his chair, his short silvered hair a bright bristle in the lamplight. The emperor passed his fingers over his mouth with enough pressure to pull slightly at the slack skin of his cheeks. His touch explored the grooves age had made near his mouth, and he seemed pleased. Then she saw that his gaze had shifted to her hands. They were trembling. She pressed them down against the table. I'm thinking about what I'll claim from you when I win, he said. The particularly appealing part of the deal you struck is the openness of your offer. Whatever you like. She wished she'd phrased things differently, though she didn't know what else she would have said, since part of what had made him agree to the game was his anticipation of the pleasure of what he was doing now. I could make you bring Arryn of Heron to me, the emperor said. He'd surrender for you. The world deadened. I never finished what I started with that boy's face. The emperor pushed the hilt of Kestrel's dagger with one finger. The sound it made, though small, scraped down her spine. Or perhaps it's not his face that appeals to me most. We could see what might be done with yours. Silence. No, Lady Kestrel? His gaze drifted over her shoulder. He continued to speak, voice soft as his list continued, and Kestrel's mind jumped between thinking that he chose to name the things that would torment her most and meant none of it, or that he did mean it and wanted her to hope that he didn't, and that this hope was his most delicious form of brutalization. Her heart was loud in her ears, this wasn't working. She'd made a grave mistake in coming. But of course, the emperor finally said, with such an offer as you made, I could exact it all. Arryn ordered his vanguard to fall to the sides of the road. The black powder sacks were lit. The Valorian cavalry reared back from what they saw too late. The sacks burst under their hooves. Chunks of paving stone exploded into the air. Do you forfeit your turn? Kestrel asked. Not at all. You're afraid to play. We both know, he said, which of us is afraid. She reached for her wine glass and drank. I do admire your love for a gamble. He took her cup and drank from it as well. I was simply thinking out loud earlier. There's no harm in thinking. I have my own thoughts. 
I am wondering why my father ever respected you. The emperor set down the cup. He's my friend. Yet you say the things that you say. He's not here, and if he were, he wouldn't care. Yes, he would. The emperor scrutinized her. You don't look like him, except the eyes. Why? The word burst from her lips. His reply was gentle. Why what, Kestrel? Her throat closed. Her eyes stung. She realized that she had forgotten the game, and that maybe this had been the Emperor's intention. She didn't want to ask her question, yet she couldn't help it, or the hurt evident in her choked voice. Why did he choose you over me? Ah, the Emperor rubbed his dry palms together and templed them with a little pat. You've provided me with an entertaining evening so far. I feel I owe you something in exchange. So, the truth. Trajan wasn't, my friend, not at first. He was necessary for what I wanted. Military prowess, imperial expansion. I, in turn, was an opportunity for what he wanted— which was nothing less than for his daughter to one day rule the empire. An understandable ambition. Or perhaps our friendship didn't begin there after all. We've known each other since well before your birth. He's a man of rare intelligence. There's pleasure in finding one's equal. Perhaps things began with that. As to how it has grown... He shrugged. Maybe it's because he knows how I am with everyone else, and knows that I'm not like that with him. I value Trajan. Ultimately, when he held your treasonous letter in his hand and saw how you had lied to him, the choice between me and you was the choice between someone who loves him and someone who didn't. Tears spilled down her cheeks, the Emperor patted her frozen hand. I suggest that we not discuss your father. He played his tile. The air reeked of sulphur and scorched horseflesh. The screams were so many and so loud that Arryn couldn't really hear them. Just noise. His ears buzzed. Valorians floundered in their blood on the broken road. Ranger arrows continued to furrow the sky. A blasted paving stone, Arryn saw, had smashed into a Harani soldier's face. Her body lay half in the mud, half where the road had been. Arryn couldn't spot the general. The Valorian army was vast. Only a few ranks of cavalry had been decimated in the blast. Another unit of Valorian cavalry moved forward into position. Kestrel was losing. Earlier, the Emperor had delayed in order to unsettle her, to revel in it, to spear her like a worm and watch her writhe. Kestrel's tactic of delay was different. She took as much time as possible to draw the game out. Earlier, she'd wanted the game to be over quickly. Now, she needed more time. The four shiny tiles in the boneyard winked at her. She knew their values. The wolf. She could use that if it were in her hand. Or even the bee. Her frustration rose. The tears had dried on her cheeks, the skin tight with salt. She couldn't help returning to what the emperor had said about her father. The memory of how her father had told her that she'd broken his heart. If he were here... She would howl at him. He had broken her heart over and over for years. He tried to force her into the mould of his own idea of honour, what he wanted her to be, not what she was. Kestrel felt her spine straighten. Damn his devotion to honour. When it came her turn to pull a tile, she didn't choose any of the marked ones. Steady, Arryn called. His horse tossed its head. 
his vanguard still held formation, those few files of broad ranks running across the road and up to the trees. The Valorian cavalry nudged towards them, looking ready to tear through Arryn's ranks. Arryn watched the cavalry shape into a wedge. The left and right sides would pull up in the clash and would try to flank the centre ranks of Arryn's army by galloping up alongside the road once Arryn's vanguard had collapsed. Yes, said Death. Good. The Emperor pulled a shiny tile. Kestrel bit back a sound, glancing away so that he couldn't read her expression. The windows had lightened. For the first time, she registered their intricate patterns of stained glass. In the dead of night, they'd looked black. Now they blushed with faint colour. She saw what they would soon fully show. Flowers, gods, the prow of a ship, a bird's flung open wings. This was an eastern room. When dawn came, it would be glorious. The armies clashed. The centre of Arryn's vanguard coalesced around him, but the edges, as planned, disintegrated, the soldiers appearing to retreat into the forest. The left and right flanks of the Valorian cavalry hurtled straight into the open spaces along the road that the edges of Arryn's vanguard had hidden. Valorian horses impaled their stomachs on the sharpened staves Arryn had had driven into the mud. The Emperor set down a fox. He examined the game in play. Things don't look so good for you, he told Kestrel. A movement amid all the others, the talk of bodies, the muddy struggle, collapse, rise, murder, caught Arryn's attention. On the periphery of battle, where guttered warhorses flailed, there was some rabbit-like thing. He couldn't look directly. He was too busy kneeing his horse out of the way of a rearing Valorian stallion's plunging hooves, then grappling with the stallion's rider. Distracted, Arryn seized the rider's arm. Not a rabbit, much too large for a rabbit. Still, that impression of something, someone, out of place, a softness, an innocence. Arryn felt the arm pop from its shoulder. The rider screamed, but Arryn wasn't paying attention. He impatiently killed the Valorian. He'd seen now what that strange movement far off to the side of the road was, among the bloody staves. It was Verex. He was struggling to free his leg, trapped beneath the body of his fallen horse. He was easy prey. Arryn saw his soldiers see the prince, but not see him as a prince, not as the one they were warned not to kill. This? A prince? Covered in mud? His only visible feature, that straw-coloured Valorian hair. Verex tugged, all thin limbs and terror. He didn't see the Dacran archer's taut bow, arrow knocked and drawn. Arryn was too far away. He shouted, no, but the word was lost in the roar of war. The archer aimed and released her arrow. I almost wish I'd lose, the emperor mused. It'd be a novel experience. Is it wrong for me to hope that, at least, this game will last longer? Improve, Kestrel, or this will be over too soon. Kestrel reminded herself that there are ways to lose, even if one holds the highest hand. She played her tile. Helpless, Arryn watched the arrow slice a low, true path towards Verex. It struck him, glancing off his metal armour. Undaunted, the archer knocked another arrow. Get down, Arryn willed as he tried to force his way to the edge of the road. He'd never reach Verex in time. Use your horse as a shield. But Verex, who now saw how the cloud of danger around him had condensed to the point of an arrowhead, froze. Arryn's gaze swivelled back to the archer, 
whose face underwent a curt shift of emotion just after she loosed the arrow, her expression slackened with horror. Arryn saw what she saw. Roshar hurtling toward the Valorian prince and into the path of the arrow. Roshar flattened Varix into the mud. The arrow sailed over his shoulder. Then Risha's brother raged at the stunned Valorian, dragged him out from under the horse, and hauled him toward the cover of the trees. They were both silent now, playing in concentration. The Emperor reached for a second shiny tile. The stained glass windows glowed, and something eased open inside Kestrel. As colour seeped into the room, she felt an unexpected wish. She wished her father were here. You, who seek your own father's death. But she didn't. She found that she couldn't, no matter how he had hurt her. She wished that he could see her play and win, that he could see what she saw now. A window is just a window, coloured glass, mere glass, but in the sun it becomes more. She would show him and say, love should do this. And you too, she would tell him, because she could no longer deny that it remained true in spite of everything. I love you too. After Roshar and Verex had vanished into the trees, Arryn stopped thinking. He rarely did in battle. It was easier to give himself over. The pressure inside was a good one. His body obeyed it. The staves had ruined the Valorian's strategy. It was impossible to flank Arryn's army, which became a solid column that thrust up the road. The edges of Arryn's vanguard began to work forward, fighting to reach the unprotected, muddy sides of the road on which the Valorians stood. With a little luck, Arryn would flank them. When his sword cut an enemy open, Arryn thought that he would have chosen no other god to rule him, that none of the hundred could please him so well. A gift, he thought. This is nothing. Death said, did I not make you a promise? Have you not kept faith with me in the hopes of this very moment? See what I have for you. Arryn looked. Just a few paces away, unhorsed, helmet gone, stood General Trajan. This was taking too long. It was full dawn, the stained windows were wild now, lurid with colour. Kestrel had reached the end of her line of play. She held a worthy hand, yet dreaded exposing her tiles to the Emperor. It didn't matter what tiles she held. All that mattered was that the game was over, and that the Emperor appeared relaxed, lids half-lowered in anticipation, his dark eyes liquid. Show me he said. Arryn spurred his horse forward. The general saw him and stood tall. Arryn's mind went blank. He heard nothing, not even death, and he should have been listening, because at the last possible moment, the general fell to one knee and drove his sword deep into the chest of Arryn's horse. As slowly as possible, Kestrel turned her last tile. Four spiders. The Emperor didn't smile. She almost wished that he had. He closed his eyes once, and when he opened them, their expression was even worse than his smile. He displayed his winning hand. Four tigers. Arryn was thrown from his shrieking horse. His head rang against the road and rang, and rang. Perspiration glimmered on the Emperor's upper lip. He touched it, glanced at his fingers strangely, then returned his attention to Kestrel. She scraped her chair back. He swept her dagger from the table and had it up to her throat in one swift movement. He pricked the skin, a tiny trickle of blood. 
She'd been stupid. Her plan had been stupid. A fool's gamble. Yet her mind kept scrabbling for an idea, something else, anything else that could reverse her mistake or make happen what should have already happened. Don't take defeat too badly, he said. If it's any consolation, I had no intention of ever fulfilling my agreement, even if you'd won. But the pleasure of the game was great. Now, sit. Her legs gave out beneath her. Let's discuss what you owe. Aaron felt the hum of metal in the air. He rocked his body out of its path, heard the general's sword strike the road. Aaron shoved himself to his feet. The emperor lowered back into his seat. Kestrel stared at his winning hand, light-headed with fear. Does the sight of this trouble you? Her dagger still in one hand, the emperor turned his tiles face down. Then he paused, frowning at their backs. He touched one of the two shiny ones, then flipped Kestrel's hand over, studying her tiles' backs. He found, in the boneyard, the two remaining marked tiles. What is this? She made an involuntary sound. He battered the air as if at an invisible insect. Coloured light beamed into the room. The four tiles shone clearly. You cheated, he muttered. How could you cheat and still lose? Aaron swung at the general, who cut the blow wide, deflecting it easily, holding it in a semi-bind that forced Aaron's sword low. Aaron's guard was open. The general was quick, his parry swift. The man's steel was so sharp that Aaron didn't feel, at first, when it cut him. The emperor licked his dry lips. He turned over the two marked tiles in the boneyard, a wolf, a snake. These are good tiles. Why would you mark tiles and not take them for yourself? He swallowed. The knot of cartilage in his throat bobbed. Kestrel saw him begin to understand. His body began to understand too. He lunged for her. The sword nicked the side of Aaron's neck just below the ear. It would have taken off his head if he hadn't recoiled in time. Aaron had been looking at the general's face without really seeing it. He saw it now. He saw that the man knew exactly who he was, and that he longed for Aaron's death almost as much as Aaron longed for his. The emperor knocked over the wine. He seized up against the table, hand clamped around Kestrel's dagger. She stepped back from the table as he shuddered against it. She felt a relief so deep that it didn't even feel like relief. It plunged straight into exhaustion. I lied, Kestrel told him. The emperor tried to push himself upright. She thought he might be trying to do something with the dagger, but his arm had gone rigid. It thumped into the spilled wine. I lied when I said I hadn't come to murder you. His eyes were wide, stark. It never mattered whether I won or lost the game, Kestrel said. Only how long the poison would take to kill you. It comes from a tiny eastern worm. In its purest form, the poison is clear. It dries to a shine. I painted it onto four bite and sting tiles. You touch them. Foam dribbled from his locked mouth. His breath rasped. It became glottal, the sound of bubbles popping. Then it ended. Aaron struck back. As they fought, viciously silent words thudded in his blood. Mother, father, sister, Kestrel. Aaron didn't care that the blows his sword hammered against the man's metal body were useless, that there was no art to this, that nothing would pierce the armour, that a few smashed buckles where the general's armour joined was no victory. He could see too little of the man's flesh, couldn't reach it, 
and he desperately wanted to make him bleed. If he couldn't carve into the general, Aaron would bludgeon him. He'd beat until something broke. The buckles, Death said. Aaron shifted the path of his sword in mid-swipe and curved it down toward the elbow of the general's sword arm, aiming right for where the broken buckles of the general's arm guard flapped loose. Aaron sheared the man's arm off at the elbow. Blood pumped onto Aaron. If the general made a sound, Aaron didn't hear it. He was warm and wet. The general fell. He lay blinking up at the sun, at Aaron. His eyes glazed, mouth moving as if speaking, but Aaron heard nothing. For a moment, Aaron faltered, but there was nothing of her in this man, this enemy at his feet. Aaron drew back his sword, more power than necessary for the death blow. He wanted to pour himself into this act. Vengeance, wine dark, thick, it flooded Aaron's lungs. Those light brown eyes on him, there was that. That one thing that Kestrel shared with her father. Aaron heard himself speak. His voice sounded far away, as if some part of him had left this road and was as high as the sun, looking down on the half that he had left on earth. He said, Kestrel asked me to do this, for she had. Aaron was a boy, a slave, a grown man, free. He was all of this at once, and something else, too. He realised it only now as he plunged his sword down towards the general's throat. He hadn't been blessed by the god of death. Aaron was the god. Chapter 40 But he stopped. Regret wasn't the right word for what he felt later. Disbelief, maybe. Sometimes, even years after the war, he'd tear out of sleep, sweating, still trapped in the nightmare where he had butchered the father of the woman he loved. But you didn't, she would tell him. You didn't. Tell me. Say it again. Tell me what you did. Trembling, he would. His brain had been a glass ball, nothing in it but echoes, his mother's scent, father's voice, how Anira's gaze had held him from across the room, and her eyes said, survive. They said, love, and I'm sorry. They said, little brother. And then silence. It became silent in Aaron's head as he stood on the road. He stopped hearing voices. He thought about how it had seemed strange that Risha would plot the Emperor's death, yet refuse to kill him herself. Aaron understood now. He knew how it was to have no family, like living in a house with no roof. Even if Kestrel were here and begged him, let your sword fall, do it, please, now, Aaron wasn't sure that he could make her an orphan and he wasn't sure that she would beg that if she were gazing down as he did on the greying face of her dying father, the man's eyes sky-bright as he tried to speak, his remaining hand fumbling against his chest, just above his heart. A throbbing radiance burned inside Aaron. He hadn't realised the pitch revenge could reach, how murder could come this close to desire, he felt his eyes sting because he knew what he was going to do. He didn't want to be here. He wondered why we can't remember when our mothers carried us inside them, the dark and steady heart, how it was the whole of the world and no one harmed us and we harmed no one. Aaron thought that if he didn't kill this man, his memory of his mother would fade. It already had over time. Some day she would be as far away as a star. But he couldn't do it. He had to do it. Tell me what you did. Aaron dropped his sword, dropped to his knees. 
yanked the woven baldric from the fallen man's shoulder and used it to make a tourniquet to save the person he hated most. After the battle, and after Rosha had accepted the Valorian surrender, when Aaron was sick with worry because Kestrel hadn't yet returned from Scythia, he went to the healer's tent. The general was asleep, his cauterized arm swathed in bandages, his armour removed. A drug had been forced down him, it had been a violent scene. Even now, asleep, the man was under guard and bound in chains at the ankles, his remaining hand strapped tight to his side. Aaron tugged at his hair until his scalp hurt. If Kestrel wasn't back by noon, he was going to ride to Scythia. His brain was crawling in his skull, his stomach was a shriveled lump. He hated seeing the general. He hated seeing even Verex, whom he halfway liked, limping around the camp, teeming with worry for Risha, but also for Kestrel, which made Aaron feel absurdly possessive, as if Verex were trying to rob him by feeling in any way similar to Aaron. Aaron became insufferable. He knew it, but he was constantly having to wrestle down the knowledge that if something had happened to Kestrel, his heart would turn to salt. He didn't know what to do with his hands as he looked down at the sleeping general. Aaron thrust them into his pockets before they went for the throat. He reminded himself why he had come. He ripped open the man's jacket. Aaron reached for the inside breast pocket, located exactly where the man had tried to touch his chest as he had lain bleeding on the road. Aaron's fingers met paper. He pulled it out. Its texture swayed soft from having been handled so much. It had been unfolded and folded many times. It was sheet music. At first, Aaron didn't understand what he looked at. Kestrel's handwriting, Harani script, musical notation in crisp black. His own name leapt off the page. Dear Aaron, then he recognised the music as the sonata Kestrel had been studying when he'd entered her music room at the Imperial Palace in late spring. It had been the last time he'd seen her before the tundra. He had thought it would be the last time he would ever see her. Aaron hastened from the tent. He couldn't read the letter here, but he didn't know if he could read it anywhere, if any place would be private enough because being alone meant he'd still be with himself, and he hated to remember how he'd left Kestrel that day, and what had befallen her after. He was desperate to read it. He couldn't bear to read it. He resented that her father had kept it. He wondered what it meant that her father had kept it. Aaron was only vaguely aware of having stumbled through the noisy camp and into the woods. The thought of reading the letter felt like a violation, like he'd be reading a letter meant for someone else. Yet it had been addressed to him. Dear Aaron. Aaron read. Are you all right? Aaron glanced up at Roshar, then returned his attention to the horse. He ran a hand down the inside of its front left leg and picked up the hoof, cupping its front. With his free hand, he cleaned the hoof with a pick, brushed it off and used a knife to probe the outer edges of the hoof, looking for the source of the problem. Steam rose from a nearby bucket of hot salted water. It was near noon. Aaron, just thinking. Kestrel's written words still radiated through him, making him feel larger inside than he had been before, as if he'd swallowed the sun and it somehow fit and blazed and ached and left him dazzled, half blind but still seeing things more clearly than before. Well, stop it, Roshar said. You've been looking either dour or dreamy, and neither really suits the victorious leader of his free people. Aaron snorted. 
The horse, feeling his knife touch a sore spot, tried to pull her hoof away. He held it fast, supporting it from below with his knee. You could at least make a rousing speech, Roshar said. Can't. I'm riding to Scythia. Roshar made a strangled sound. Not on this horse, Aaron said. She's lame. What are you doing? She was limping. It hurt to look at her. An abscess, I think. She must have stepped on something sharp. Aaron, you're not a damn farrier. Someone else can do this. <sighs> Aaron hissed in sympathy when he found the abscess. The horse tried again to tug away, but he punctured the sealed wound which instantly dribbled black pus. He worked on opening the abscess, then pressed the rest of the pus out. Bring that bucket closer, will you? Oh, certainly. I live to please. Aaron lowered the hoof into the bucket's hot water. The horse, already in pain, stamped, splashing the water as she reared her head. But Aaron grabbed the halter and brought her head down, soothing her as he watched the foot to make sure it stayed in the bucket. Aaron, why are you so transparent? Whenever you worry, you start fixing things. Draining nasty gunk from a hoof is the least of it. I don't know what's worse, watching you do that or knowing how hard it will always be for you to keep yourself to yourself. Aaron stroked the horse's neck. She stamped again, but began to calm. We won, Rosha said. And Kestrel is fine. We've discussed this. That poison is highly toxic. But she's not back. She will be. You need to seize your political moment. If you don't, someone else will. Aaron squinted at him. You call me transparent as if that's a bad thing. But I don't need to make a speech for my people to see what I am. Roshar shut his mouth. He looked ready to say something else, then didn't, because Kestrel and Risha rode into camp. Chapter 41 The army moved at a slow pace towards the city, some on foot and many wounded. Kestrel stayed away from the wagons that carried them, I can't see him, she told Aaron when the army paused to rest, but part of her wanted to use this time to see her father. You don't have to, Aaron said. In the silence that followed as they walked away from the wagons, fragments of everything he had told her gained shape and terribly vivid colour. Her father's severed arm, Aaron's lost vengeance, the letter that she hadn't even recognised when Aaron gave it to her. It was a moment before Kestrel realised that a jittery energy had come over Aaron. He was biting his lower lip, and his hands were making stunted gestures, as if he were trying to speak, but couldn't. Finally, he said, You asked for his death. I didn't do it. Should I have? Did I do the wrong thing? A gentle feeling flowed into her. She caught his erratic hands and held them between hers. No, she said, you didn't. That letter. She read and reread it, in the high summer grasses on the sides of the road, at night by lamplight. The pen's ink had aged, gone brownish, she imagined her father reading under the sun during the campaign. Spots of the paper had a waxy transparency, the residue of oil used to polish a weapon. Her father liked to clean his own dagger. She searched for meaning in the smudges of dirty fingerprints under certain words, but nothing, really, was evidence of anything except the urgent scrawl of her own handwriting. The bottom half of the letter was warped with rusted blood, the final sentences lost. Kestrel couldn't remember what she'd written there, like a worn map, 
the letter folded instantly under the slightest pressure. The paper looked quiet in her hand, tucked in on itself. Kestrel wanted to reach through time and comfort the girl who'd written it, even if the only comfort she could offer would be understanding. She wanted to imagine a different story, one where her father read the letter and understood it too, and returned it to his daughter, telling her that she should never have had to write anything like that. I love you. I'd do anything for you, the letter said, and it was hard for Kestrel to keep from crumpling the paper in her fist when she realised that these words were what she had always wanted her father to say to her. Three days from the city, the army had made camp for the night. Kestrel went to the healer's tent. Her father noticed the moment she entered. He flinched, then met her gaze, and she didn't know what was right to feel. The sort of soft, heavy comfort that touched her at the sight of her father, simply because he was her father, or the rage in her chest, or how she wanted to mourn his maimed arm and wanted to tell him that he deserved it. Why did you keep my letter? she asked. He said nothing. She asked again. He turned his face from her. She kept asking until she heard her voice crumbling and thought that Risha had been wrong when she'd said that forgiveness was like mud, as if it could take whatever shape you needed. It was hard. It was stone. She walked away from the tent. Varek said that he and Risha were leaving. They wanted to ride to the eastern plains and maybe sail from Dakra's eastern coast to see what lay in the unexplored waters beyond. He had no wish to inherit the empire. He asked that rumours of his death be spread. He saw Kestrel's fallen expression. You think I should go back to the capital instead and become emperor? Honestly, I don't want you to go anywhere. I'll miss you. His brown eyes warmed. I'll visit. Risha, too. She wants to train you in your weapon of choice until you feel properly dangerous. Kestrel opened her mouth to say that'd be a useless effort, but then it struck her that it might not be, and whether it was or wasn't didn't matter as much as the happiness the offer gave her. I like her, too. They were leaning against the trunk of a very broad tree near the encampment. White spores from its flowering branches floated down. She wondered if a Harani would think this the sign of a god, and if so, which one? I'm sorry, she told Varex. He knew what she meant. I had no love for my father. He certainly had none for me. Still, I'm not sure what else you could have done. If anything, he slouched against the bark. I feel worst about being relieved. A spore landed on the tip of his boot, then floated away. In a low voice, he added, and a bit of a coward. I worry that if I became emperor, I'd become like him. Not you. Never. And guilty, because I'm abandoning a country that might collapse on itself. It's not clear who'll rule now. I bet you have some ideas. I can think of a few senators who'd claw their way to power. Or the captain of the guard. I don't remember everyone at court, though. Or who owes whom, or bears a grudge. You could give me a clearer picture, and I could... Well keep an eye on the situation in the capital. He raised his brows. A spy again, Kestrel? Spy master, maybe. He picked up a thin fallen twig and snapped it into tiny sticks. I think Karen needs one, she said. You'd be the best. I wish, however, that you didn't always risk yourself. You're too fond of a gamble. She shrugged helplessly. I am who I am. Affection tinged his smile. Then he sobered and said, 
I used to believe I could stomach taking my father's place, but Risha would be miserable. I would, too. Kestrel, suddenly fierce, said, Then be happy. I will, he said, if you will. Feathery white fluff came down from the tree as he described the political intricacies of the Valorian court, and then told her about how the puppy he'd given her at court had grown into an enormous, sweet-tempered dog living with a family in the foothills of the Valorian Mountains. There were small children who adored her, even when she chewed their shoes. Maris, a young courtier Kestrel had intensely disliked until she found that actually she didn't, had married well and was gleefully smug about it. As for Jess... Verex said that she had gone to the Southern Isles at the start of the war. I wish I knew more, he said. Kestrel longed to see her. She wondered if she ever would, and if they could mend the things wrong between them. I saw you go to the healer's tent the other day, Verex said. He won't talk with me. Try again. When Risha and Verex left... Two days before the army would reach the city, Kestrel kept her smile as she kissed their cheeks. At first it was hard to be strong in that way and not let the farewell overwhelm her, but then she noticed Roshar, who had avoided his little sister since her return as if afraid of her, lingering nearby. Risha approached him and whispered something Kestrel couldn't hear. Roshar's expression eased, he didn't speak in reply, he simply clasped Risha's hands and kissed them. Kestrel thought that maybe she had been wrong, and Risha had been wrong about forgiveness, that it was neither mud nor stone, but resembled more the drifting white spores. They came loose from the trees when they were ready, soft to the touch, but made to be let go, so that they could find a place to plant and grow. She went to the tent again. This time her father spoke before she could. Give me your dagger. Hot tears rushed to her eyes. Don't you dare. Unbind my hand. Give me your dagger. No, just this one last thing. You can't ask me to help you kill yourself. He no longer looked at her. Why did you keep my letter? She asked yet again. You know why. What? Regret? That's not the right word. Then what? There are no words. Find some. I can't. Now. He swallowed. I want to. I didn't know how everything would become impossible. This is what happens when you destroy the thing most precious to you. You chose to do it. Yes. Why? He didn't say, but his eyes became clear, hard shells, and she knew that it hadn't been only his code of honour that had made him tell the Emperor of her treason. Her father had wanted to hurt her because she had hurt him. He said, It didn't seem real when I was doing it, like I wasn't awake. Do you know, she whispered, what they did to me in the mines? He closed his eyes. She described it. He let her. Water slid from beneath his eyelids. Kestrel, he said finally, you know that there is only one solution. I can't be a father to you. But you are. There's no place for me here. Am I to be a prisoner for the rest of my life? This had been discussed loudly. Rosha was in favour of a public execution. Aaron had lost his temper in a way that Kestrel hadn't seen in a long time, had shouted back that the general's fate was Kestrel's choice alone. I don't know, Kestrel told her father. There was a silence. She said, how can you not even ask for forgiveness? Impossible. 
ask. For a long time, he said nothing. I can't ask for something no one could give. I ask for mercy. Her vision blurred, and Kestrel knew that forgiveness and mercy would take years for them both, and that she needed every single minute of that time. She said that she still loved him, because it was true. He owed her better answers than the ones he had given, and even if he never had them, it was her right to keep asking. She would never give him her dagger. I tried so hard to live in your world, she told him. Now it's your turn to live in mine. Chapter 42 Aaron should have expected it, but somehow didn't. So many flowers. All the summer blooms must have been cut from the gardens, which would be naked for weeks. When the army came through the gate, a roar vibrated the stone walls, and Aaron flinched in surprise, hands tightening on the reins, for the tiniest moment believing that the sound meant danger. Then he saw the glowing faces of people thronging the streets and thought, Ah, happy, which made him happy. And as Kestrel smiled at him from her seat on Javelin, a pink petal clinging to her cheek, it occurred to him that he might have to grow comfortable with happiness, because it might not abandon him this time. Then Kestrel's head turned, and he saw her survey the Dakran Harani army unfurled behind them in Lahiran's main street, a tension in the line of her mouth. She said, I'm not sure it's wise to bring all the soldiers within the city walls. This is everyone's victory. Everyone must be honoured. I know, but our eastern allies outnumber us. He knew what she was getting at. They always have. If they want this country, it'd be easy for them to take it, especially from within the city walls. Aaron glanced at Roshar, who'd ridden ahead to meet the Queen. I trust him. Yes, I know. Aaron paused his horse. Javelin stopped too. Flowers flurried down around them. He said, It would hurt me to suspect him. That's why I do it for you. A cloth dropped onto his head from above, from a window of one of the tall, narrow homes near the market. Startled, blind, Aaron tugged it from his face, his horse shying beneath him. It was an old Harani flag, stitched with the royal crest. Aaron said, But the royal line is gone. They're looking for something to call you, Kestrel said, nudging Javelin forward. Not this. It's not right. Don't worry. They'll find the right words to describe you. And you. Oh, that's easy. It is. It seemed impossible to name everything she was to him. Kestrel's expression was serious, luminous. He loved to see her like this. They'll say that I'm yours, she told him, just as you are mine. When Sarzin saw Kestrel, her eyes narrowed to mere cracks, and Kestrel became very conscious that Sarzin was a tall woman. For someone with a reputation for being so smart, Sarzin said, you act like you haven't a thought in your head. Did it never occur to you that I'd worry when you disappeared from the city with no word? I didn't exactly mean to leave. Oh, so it just happened. Yes, the gods made you do it. Kestrel laughed. Maybe they did. Then, earnestly, she said, I'm sorry, Sarzin. Sarzin folded her arms. Then make it up to me. How? Sarzin's expression softened. Now there was an inquisitive gleam in her eye. Start with the night you left, end with this very moment, and tell me everything. So Kestrel did. 
there was to be a city-wide feast to celebrate the military victory, with a banquet at the governor's palace where Queen Inishunawe would preside. The cooks in Arryn's house were hard at work, slaughtering every chicken in the yard, pulping a rusty fruit and thumping dough against flowered tables. Arryn was in the still room, trying to soothe the anxiety of a woman who was saying that she had just preserved the jams, and must all of them be used for the banquet? Every last one? She didn't think the Dacrons appreciated Ilia fruit. Why serve something they wouldn't love as much as the Harani did? It would be best, surely, to keep at least those jars for winter. Trying to explain the politics of such lavish consumption tangled Arryn up in frustrated half-sentences, because it didn't make much sense to him, either, to consume every edible thing in one night. And then he heard Roshar's accented voice in Harani drifting down the hall from the kitchens. You don't understand. The piece of meat must be the finest, cut from the loin, seasoned with this spice, not that one. Arryn excused himself, told the woman he'd discuss jams later, and followed the prince's voice. And it must be well roasted on the outside, almost charred, yet bloody inside. Bright pink. Listen, this is crucial. If anything goes wrong, the banquet will be ruined. Arryn entered the main kitchen to find the prince haranguing the head cook, who slid a half-lidded look of annoyed sufferance at Arryn. There you are, Roshar beamed. I need your help, Arryn. For the preparation of meat, it's very important. You must impress this importance upon your cook here. The fate of political relations between my country and yours hangs in the balance. Because of meat. It's uh, for his tiger, said the cook. Arryn palmed his face, eyes squeezed shut. Your tiger. He's very particular, said Rosha. You can't bring the tiger to the banquet. Little Arryn has missed me. I will not be parted from him. Would you consider changing his name? No. What if I begged? Not a chance. Rosha, the tiger has grown. And what a sweet big boy he is. You can't bring him into a dining hall filled with hundreds of people. He'll behave. He has the mien and manners of a prince. Oh, like you. I resent your tone. I'm not sure you can control him. Has he ever been aught but the gentlest of creatures? Would you deny your namesake the chance to bear witness to our victorious celebration? And, of course, to the vision of you and Kestrel, side by side, Herani and Valorian, a love for the ages, the stuff of songs, Arryn, how you'll get married and make babies. Gods, Rosha, shut up. Even if Arryn hadn't known how much Kestrel hated to enter the palace built for the Valorian governor during the period of colonisation, he would have seen it in her tense shoulders. The way she touched the dagger at her hip and practically snarled at Rosha when the prince had suggested that surely she could forego this one night the barbarism of openly bearing a weapon. Arryn gave him a warning look. The prince pretended to look innocently confused, then shrugged and moved to walk ahead of them, the half-grown tiger slinking at his heels. The tiger was eerily docile, even for a young one raised by humans. It pushed its head up under Roshar's hand like a house cat. Arryn watched its solid sway, the already powerful shoulder blades rising and falling under its fur. Arryn sensed, but couldn't name the origin, of what made people, animals too apparently, long to follow the prince. With an uncomfortable prickle, 
he suspected that if he asked, and Rochard deigned to give a straight answer, the prince would say that whatever it was, Arryn possessed it too. A strange feeling, as if filaments trailed from Arryn's body, a thousand fishing lines snagging attention here and there, little tugs, people caught on the lines, the way sometimes people couldn't look him in the eye, and when they did, they became fish trying to breathe air. He wished it weren't like that. He knew it would be necessary. Roshar and the tiger disappeared inside, leaving Kestrel and Arryn alone on the path. Kestrel was stiff, her delicate shoes planted in the walkway's gravel. She had lifted the hem of her storm-green skirts, the gesture of a lady, but he saw how she made fists of the fabric. I'm sorry, he said, guessing what troubled her, the memory of the first winter rebellion, her dead friends, Arryn's deception, the halls of the governor's palace choked with corpses. She gave him a narrow look. Part of you isn't sorry. He couldn't deny it. But she softened and said, I'm not innocent either. I too feel sorry and not sorry about things I've done. She let her dresser's hem fall to the stones and touched three fingers to the back of his hand. Arryn forgot for a moment where he was and what they were discussing. A marvel that such a light touch could feel like a whole caress, that his body could ignite so easily. Now she looked amused. Let's leave. He slid a hand beneath her loose hair and thumbed the slope of her neck, feeling the fluttery pulse there. Her expression changed, amusement melting into slow pleasure. He said, Let's not go in. Arryn, she sighed, we must go in. Her slightly parted mouth closed again into a tense line. What else is troubling you? The Queen hasn't said a word to you. Well, Arryn said, uncomfortable, thinking of various reasons for Anisha's silence. All of the Dacrons are too quiet. Not Roshar. Him too. He just says a lot without meaning much. Arryn paused, then said, I believe in our alliance. I want to, too. He offered her his hand. They went inside. They sat at a table on a raised dais in the dining hall, the four of them in a line, Arryn and the Queen occupying the centre, and Kestrel and Roshar to their sides, an arrangement Roshar manoeuvred without seeming to, as the hundreds of people already seated watched them. The Queen gave Arryn a sidelong glance, her black eyes unreadable. She said nothing and didn't look at him again. Roshar, the tiger curled at his feet, barely touched his food as the first courses were served, but instead drank the green dacron liqueur he favoured. Arryn saw, beyond the silhouette of the queen, how Roshar clenched and released the glass. His fingers were unsteady. Brother, the queen spoke as if nudging him. Leave me alone. He refilled his cup. When people entered bearing the main course, including, Arryn noticed with wry amusement, the fastidiously prepared loin for the tiger on its very own platter, Roshar stood, swaying a little. The room hushed. He scanned the faces, Dacron and Harani alike. People of the Hundred he said, using an ancient Tehrani phrase Arryn was surprised he knew. Who leads you? So many cried Arryn's name that it no longer sounded like his name. Do you trust your country to him? Yes. Would you say that Heron is his? Yes. Sudden distrust slicked down Arryn's spine. 
Roshar raised his hand to quiet the roaring crowd, and Arryn was reminded of Cheat, relishing his role as an auctioneer. A stone rose in his throat. Kestrel's hand tightened on his, but Arryn no longer felt wholly there. Enough, said the Queen, not so much in reprimand, but rather as if telling him to get to the point. I have fought for Arryn, bled for him. I hold him in my heart. I have even named my tiger after him. No small honour. And yet, we have a problem. Arryn of Heron was not always my friend, and once committed an offence against me that caused my queen to award me control over all he owns, his life, his belongings, and, since you say he possesses it, his country. I've been told to take from Arryn what is due to me. I've been told it is mine by law. Must I? Yes. Will my people support my claim with force, if necessary? They will. Will my queen rise in admiration of me? Oh, indeed, and so I must. No, Arryn, sit down. Otherwise you'll make an ass out of yourself, and that role is mine. I see my tiger's meal is here. You, there, yes, you, with the platter, bear it forth. Kestrel laughed. Arryn felt, rather than saw, that she had relaxed beside him, aglow with mirth. He sank back into his chair, because now he too understood Roshar's game. He wanted to sag with relief. He wanted to strangle the prince. And thank him. There, Roshar flourished a hand at the platter. Arryn the tiger's meal. Since I've been ordered to take from Arryn what belongs to Arryn, I shall. Roshar returned to his seat, platter in hand, and commenced cutting the meat. He took a bite. Mmm, this is excellent. So well done. Now, as for what belongs to Arryn the human, I relinquish any claim to it. Nothing of his was ever mine to take, nor will ever be. What belongs to him, I defend his right to keep, out of my love for him, and his for me. He looked directly at the queen as he ate. This is delicious, exactly the way I like it. The queen forced a smile. Oh, and would someone bring another slice of loin? Raw, please. My tiger is hungry. Chapter 43 I don't want you to go. Waves rocked against the pier. The sun was too bright. Weathered boards creaked beneath Arryn's feet. Only because you enjoy a good bully, someone to make you behave as you ought. No, Rosha. You know well enough what to do now. You'll be fine. That's not why. Why you'll miss me. I admit that the impending absence of my keen wit would make anyone sad. Not exactly. Now I'm getting sad, just thinking about how it would feel to be parted from my sweet self. Lucky me, I will always have my own company. What you said at the banquet was true. Everything I say is true. That I love you. Roshar's face went still. I said that? You know that you did. That was more for the drama of the moment. Liar. I am, aren't I? Roshar said slowly. I really am, Arryn. His voice roughened. You'll see me again. Soon, Arryn told him, and embraced him. Then they broke away and maybe some would have thought that the sun was a little cruel for how its brightness allowed no subterfuge in their expressions, and everything that could be seen was shown. 
but Aaron thought that it was a kindness. He wanted to be a mirror, to reflect what Rochelle was to him. A launch waited in the water below. Aaron wished him fair tides. He watched until the launch reached Rochelle's ship, then watched as the ship, with the rest of the entire Dacron fleet, left his city's bay. He glimpsed Sarzine as he walked through the city. She had a laden basket. It dragged at her arm, making its weight known even from far away. Her faintly harried expression softened at the sight of him. Aaron took the basket from her. Coming or going? I've an errand here and won't be home until late. Shall I guess what brings you to town? You can try. He peeked in the basket. Bread still warm from the oven. A bottle of liquor. Long, flat pieces of wood. Rolls of gauze. A picnic? With a wounded soldier, Sarzine, he teased. Is it true, love? What's the wood for? Wait, don't tell me. I'm not sure I want to know. She swatted him. The Cartwright's oldest daughter has a broken arm. It dropped ice to the bottom of his stomach. He thought of the ruined bodies he'd seen, including the ones he himself had ruined. He realised that he had somehow expected that he'd never have to think again about the way people damage other people. The night of the invasion, Kestrel's back, his own, Rochard's scarred face, his own. The way a body on the battlefield could look as if it had never been human, and that was exactly what Aaron had wanted to do to Kestrel's father, who was in this city, his city, in a prison made to be comfortable when no comfort could return the man's arm, and no walls could imprison Aaron's knowledge of what he had done and wanted to do and couldn't regret. Yet he did regret. He could not. He did. Aaron, are you all right? How? he managed. How did her arm break? She fell off a ladder. He must have visibly relaxed, because his cousin raised her brows and looked ready to scold. I imagine something worse, he tried to explain. She appeared to understand his relief that pain, if it had to come, came this time without malice. Just an accident, done by no one. The luck, sometimes, of life. A bad slip that ends with bread and someone to bind you. It was a long walk home, but a pleasure to regain, unexpectedly, the memory of walking home as a child, secure in the knowledge that he would find everything he loved there, whole and unbroken, his certainty so absolute that he hadn't even been aware of it. The city gave way to cypress trees, his feet were dusty, the sun made every scent stronger, his hot skin, the roasted path, a breath of lavender blown from somewhere he couldn't see. The god of death was silent, not gone, inhabiting Aaron, but comfortably, in a kind of kinship. Aaron kept company with death, but death was not all that lived inside him. A girl in his heart, in his home, waiting for him. There were old stone steps cut into the final hill. His pace quickened. The house rose into view, sequined with open windows. A warhorse was cropping the meadow. Although Aaron was eager to see Kestrel, he would have to wait. He caught threads of music from far away. As he came across the grass, the piano's melody strengthened, it opened within him a happiness that gathered and gleamed, glossy, but the way water is, with weight. A lovely fatigue claimed him. He lay down on the grass and listened. He thought about how Kestrel had slept on the palace lawn and dreamed of him. 
When she had told him this, he'd wished that it had been real. He'd tried to imagine the dream, then found himself dreaming. Everything made sense in his dream, yet he felt the tenuousness of this perfect reason, the arch of Kestrel's bare foot, an old tale about the god of death and the seamstress. Arryn would lose, upon waking, his understanding of why touching Kestrel would arouse the memory of a story he'd not thought about in a long time. He dreamed, one stocking balled in his fist, and the stray question of how it had been made. Who had sown this? He saw his hands, though they did not look like his hands, measuring and cutting fabric, sewing invisible stitches. A dark-haired boy tumbled from a room, a godmark upon his brow. When a guest entered and said, Weave me the cloth of yourself, Aaron thought that he was the forbidding guest, and the child, and the sewing girl, all at once. She said, I am going to miss you when I wake up. Don't wake up, he answered, but he did. Kestrel, beside him on the grass, said, Did I wake you? I didn't mean to. It took him a velvety moment to understand that this was real. The air was quiet, an insect beat its clear wings. She brushed hair from his brow. Now he was very awake. You were sleeping so sweetly, she said. Dreaming, he touched her tender mouth. About what? Come closer and I'll tell you. But he forgot. He kissed her and became lost in the exquisite sensation of his skin becoming too tight for his body. He murmured other things instead. A secret, a want, a promise. A story in its own way. She curled her fingers into the green earth. Chapter 44 The night was fresh and foretold summer's end. The slow, hot day gave way to a breeze as cool as laundered sheets. Kestrel, in the stables, fed Javelin a carrot. She promised him apples. Soon, she said, and wondered if horses notice how the seasons change. Do they see apples swell on the trees? Have they any way to mark the passage of time, or is it always now for them, with no sense of then? Maybe soon had no meaning either. She'd meant to visit her father. She'd wanted to ask him about her childhood. Her memory was still a tattered thing sometimes, and Aaron couldn't tell her what he himself didn't know. She wanted to ask her father, How was it when you gave me javelin? What was my first word? Did you save my milk teeth, or did my nurse plant them in the ground as the Harani do? What was I like, and how were you with me, and with my mother? She wouldn't have known some of the answers even if her memory hadn't been damaged. Everyone loses pieces of the past. But then it occurred to her that her father might not know either, or that he would and say nothing. Or he would and try to bargain his memories for the use of her dagger. Kestrel's courage failed her. She didn't go to the prison. You will when you can. Aaron had said when she'd told him. I should be able to now. This isn't a wound in the flesh. No one can say how long it takes to heal. Then she had noticed that Aaron's fingernails were blackened, and how he kept reaching into his pocket as if to reassure himself that something was there. She had told herself not to guess, but she could never help guessing. A smile warmed her face. He shut his eyes in mock chagrin. Gods, can I keep nothing from you? I didn't mean to. Devious thing. I won't give it to you yet. It's for Ninareth. Time seemed strange. It was as if the ring were already on her smallest finger, the most vulnerable one. It's simple, Aaron had hastened to say. I will love it. 
Will you wear it? Yes, always. Yes, she had said. If you show me how to make one for you, too. Kestrel gave her horse a final caress. It was full night. She left the stables. Fireflies spangled the black lawn. She thought about Aaron's expression when she'd asked if he would teach her how to forge a ring for him, and the whole conversation glowed within her like one of those fireflies. Watching them, you'd almost think that a firefly winks out of existence, then comes to life, vanishes again, returns. That when it's not lit, it's not there at all. But it is. A night breeze ruffled a curtain. Aaron's bedroom, she realised with soft surprise, had come to feel like her own. He was lazily tracing circles on her belly. It hypnotised her into a rare, pure unthinking. He settled back on the bed, propped on one elbow. It occurs to me that there is something we have never done. Her thoughts rushed back. She arched one brow. He moved to whisper in her ear. Yes, she laughed. Let's. Now. Now. So they reached for dressing robes and the bedside lamp and padded barefoot through his suite, rushing slightly and then through the silent house, suppressing giddy breaths. They couldn't look each other in the face. A wild, loud joyousness threatened to break free if they did. They wound down the staircase and into the parlour. They shut the door behind them, but still... We are going to wake the whole house, Kestrel said. How should we do this? She led him to her piano. Easy. He placed a palm on the instrument, as if already feeling it vibrate with music. He cleared his throat. Now that I think about it, I'm a little nervous. You've sung for me before. Not the same. Aaron, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Her words silenced him, steadied him. Anticipation lifted within her like the fragrance of a garden under the rain. She sat at the piano, touching the keys. Ready? He smiled. Play. This has been an Audible Studios production of The Winner's Kiss. Written by Marie Rutkowski. Narrated by Kate Rawson. Producer, Mike Charzuk. Copyright 2016. Production Copyright 2016 by Audible Inc.